All right, good morning all. It's uh, nine o'clock central time. So um, welcome to the uh, 2021 uh, biodiesel, Kansas Biodiesel Consortium uh, Biodiesel Workshop. Uh, the sustainability of the biodiesel industry is our general topic for today. Hi, I'm Ed Brokish at Kansas State University. I'm one of the, the organizers of the, the group. Uh, we'll be uh, um, having uh, four speakers today. Um, tell you a little bit about the Biodiesel Consortium before we get into the speakers. It's a, a group of uh, uh, academics from uh, Kansas State University, University of Kansas, North Central Kansas Technical College uh, and uh, Seward County Community College. Uh, Susan Williams is from the uh, University of Kansas. Uh, Dan Hyman is from uh, uh, North Central Kansas Technical College. And we have uh, uh, from Seward County, uh, Josh uh, Morris. Um, each of these institutions have a uh, biodiesel club and uh, to uh, support that, uh, that is supported to support is supported by the Kansas Soybean Commission and they are supporting us on this uh, uh, workshop as well as the uh, Central Kansas uh, Clean Cities. And I'm make sure I say that right, but uh, the Clean Cities group uh, with uh, Tammy Alexander is uh, uh, helping us with this uh, workshop. She's, uh, many of you know her and have um, gotten, uh, was contacted uh, with as a part of this workshop. Uh, we're uh, today the uh, uh, the goal of the uh, uh, Kansas score, the biodiesel consortium is to kind of become the go to place for biodiesel education in the state of Kansas and this workshop is part of that effort. Um, as we look to the future of uh, energy and United States, uh, we are uh, looking for economically sustainable uh, energy sources as well as environmentally sustainable uh, energy sources. And that's uh, why we came up with this topic. Um, so uh, the, uh, we'll get into it here in a second. I need to introduce a, a couple people yet. Uh, Jancy Hall from the Kansas Soybean Commission is uh, doing the uh, uh, technical support on this and she will uh, has put this all together and, and done a wonderful job on that. So thank you very much to, to Jancy. Uh, and then Susan Williams will be handling the questions and moderating that uh, in the background. Uh, so uh, um, we appreciate Susan doing that or I appreciate Susan doing that for me. Uh, so with that, we will move on to uh, the our first speakers today are uh, Jim and Andy from the uh, uh, Hutchison uh, Salt Mine. Um, they've been using biodiesel for a number of years and uh, have a, a pretty good history with it. And so uh, we'll turn it over to them and let them talk about their experiences with biodiesel and tell us a little bit about the salt mines. Yeah, how's it going guys? Going great. Uh we uh, here at Hutchison Salt Company, we've recognized that uh, one of the major benefits from biodiesel is the indoor air quality. Uh, back in 2003, we started using B100 biodiesel when the salt mine first tested the fuel in its underground loader. And today, 17 years later in Hutchison Salt Company, we continue to rely on that fuel to improve the air quality for our miners. It's uh, located here in Hutchison, Kansas. The Hutchison Salt Company operates our salt mine that produces highway salt and inclement, inclement weather and salt for animal feed. Our air quality is critical for our miners to quote Jim Barta. It is also great when it works in our diesel, or our diesel equipment. We want everything that we can to protect our miners and biodiesel does just that by reducing harmful emissions and particles. Our underground miners report that the biodiesel particulates do not get in their nostrils and the air is noticeably cleaner. 
fact, a lot of times it smells like uh, French fries. In addition to our improved air quality, Jim has highlighted several other benefits to the using the biodiesel or diesel mechanics with 40 years plus of experience working on regular diesel engines has tore down one of the B100 fuel engines shortly after he started at the mine. He couldn't believe how clean it was compared to regular diesel engines. He also has noted that biodiesel adds lubrication so that our injectors work more efficiently. Long-term equipment operators report no loss of power or torque. Ultimately, the engines actually run better. Hutchison Salt Company has began using biodiesel in 2003 and has stopped for a short time in 2012 to 2015 during a staff transition. Last year, the company used 48,000 gallons of soy biodiesel in underground equipment, including loaders, diesel pickups, tractors, bobcats, powder truck, and for explosives for portable welders. So we've uh, seen a lot of benefits as far as safety. Uh, our equipment seems to last longer and run better. And it's also been a pretty decent with the tax breaks and other incentives that they've used in the past here uh, to use the biodiesel. You know, a big thing for us is all the, uh, besides the guys working in the mine, uh, we have also underground vaults and storage in the museum and until uh, 2020 we used to see several uh, school groups uh, through the mine weekly so it was a huge thing when I came in 2015 uh, going back to the biodiesel I spent probably the first six months I was here underground and standard diesel it was just uh, it was uh, horrible you could tell a huge difference uh, in there after we made the transition we haven't had any equipment issues. The The main thing when you do tran uh, transition from uh, standard diesel to bio, you do uh, initially have some issues with hoses and also uh, fuel filters as the biodiesel uh, cleans out the diesel motor itself. So uh, like Andy said, it's, it's been really good for us and uh, have totally have no complaints. And we'll, we'll keep using biodiesel as long as I'm at the mine. Did you have anything else to add, Andy? Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Andy and Jim, this is Susan Williams, and we had a couple of questions in the in the chat. Um, one of the questions is, how do you source or specify the biodiesel? Are there specific things that you're looking for when you're when you're ordering it from companies? Yeah, we do. We we want to make sure it is the bio. I had uh, you know that it's the B ninety nine. I had issues years ago when I was uh, at Independent Salt in Canopolis, Kansas, where we had bought uh, uh, some bio, but it was not the soy, and it, we had a lot of problems with the equipment. We typically uh, purchase our biodiesel through a Bridgman Oil Company here in Hutchison. We try to keep everything as local as possible to support the community. And is there any special um, handling that you need to do once you, well, I guess maybe, how do you get the biodiesel down into the mine, and then and is there any special handling or anything you need to do when you've got it down there? Uh, we just uh, we put it all in 250 gallon steel totes and we store it underground. I when I had uh, surface storage previously, you, you had you did have to deal with the uh, incumbent weather when it got cold out. You'd have some issues then. You'd either have to heat it or uh, have the tank heated or or uh, make sure that you had uh, took it down before we had any issues with the weather coming in. But storing it underground, there doesn't seem to be any problem at all. And if I remember correctly, you guys have pretty, pretty uh, perfect climate uh, in the, in the mine. Yeah, yeah, it's about seventy degrees year round, so it's really nice, nice work atmosphere. So, uh, one of the question is, I think you said you switched to biodiesel in two thousand and four. Is that correct? Uh, I would have seen they they ran it for quite a few years, and then they had a management change. And uh, the manager that was uh, here before me, he, he stopped using the bio to try to save a buck. And then uh, we went back to it in 2015. Okay. I, I told the owners I'd find another way to, you know, make up for the cost difference, you know, save money somewhere else. It was just uh, 
too important to me and everybody else here that we made sure we had clean air underground for all the guys and our visitors. So uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the operation of the mine and, and the size of it and, uh, you know, um, where, how, it, how it's grown, let's say, from 2004 when you started using it to, to now. Yeah, it's, uh, I tell you, the, uh, when I started in mining, used to, the summer months were pretty slow. And uh, due to the uh, volume of uh, weather that we, we've typically had, a lot of the places have started storing salt. So we have went to basically a year-round operation for de-icing and, of course, the feed salt. Uh, our last two years of production, we've produced about 800,000 tons each year. And that's that's pretty good for the size of the mine. Typically, you want to produce about 500,000 tons of product per year uh, to be profitable. So we've had two really good years in a row. The mines uh, expanded quite a bit since 2004. Um, we probably have about two and a half miles of conveyor right now. And our furthest working face is about two and three quarter miles from the main shaft at the mine itself. So there's a little bit of a, a travel out, out to that area. Have you noticed as the mine started to expand, your fuel consumption has increased over time? Uh, we, what we do, it has a little bit, but uh, at our working faces, uh, we typically keep uh, the belt as close to the face as possible. We advance every 250 feet. That way the uh, LHDs don't have to tram as far. But you do have more consumption, of course, for for the man uh, man travel out to the working face, and I anticipate that'll keep to uh, increase, you know, as well with the amount of production we have each year. So that's a, a big key factor. Great. You mentioned that the the about you know quote unquote saving a buck. Uh, do you know how much the the difference is in the cost for you from you know using biodiesel versus using uh, um, regular diesel and and is that cost offset by increased efficiency or, or anything else? I I tell you we've had I think the last few years there's been a government credit for using the, the B100 and you typically Bridgman will give that back to us. I think the biodiesel I'm not sure what the current prices are on it but we typically in the past have been paying maybe a dollar more a gallon for it somewhere in that market. Um, I, we really haven't had the savings from using it besides the hell. And, and, uh, uh effects. Ed, did we lose Andy or am I having problems on my end? I, I think we've, uh, might've lost them or they're at least they froze up. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for them to join us, I've got a couple of people that have put questions in the chat. So uh, if you keep uh, keep putting questions in there, I'm happy to moderate. Or if you would like to ask a question, please let me know and I'm happy to, to turn it over to you. So. Okay. Andy and Jim, are you back? Susan, I can. <laughs> yeah, we lost oh. you for a minute there. Perfect. Great. I think we've got you back. Yeah. Ted, were you going to jump in or were you going to ask a question? Uh, I was going to help answer the question on costs, at least in today's world. Um, if you'd yeah, like some great. feedback on that. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Right. So I guess just introduce myself just a little bit. I'm not supposed to be speaking yet, but I'll answer since we uh, lost lost you guys there. But uh, I'm Ted Augustine. I work for 24-7 Travel Stores here in Kansas. We have 10 locations, eight on I-70, two on 135. Um, I am a Kansas State grad, so happy to be supporting the consortium today. I'm a mechanical engineering student from, from Kansas State. Went down to Houston, Texas, worked for ExxonMobil for four years before coming back to the great state of Kansas. So Happy to be on the call today. Uh, as far as cost goes, um, you know, we are a for-profit for business. So we're in the biodiesel game, uh, primarily for the financial aspect. So it does offer us quite a bit of cost savings on the, on the fuel when, when blending it in. Uh, we put in a 25,000 gallon tank at our North Ninth location here in Salina. 
Um, we run a mini terminal out of that location and be able to supply five other sites with biodiesel blends. That site in particular has an inline blender where it automatically blends in. So um, we do try and manage those blends based off economics and based off cold weather conditions. But um, with the biodiesel tax credits um, and other factors that play into that, we do save quite a bit per gallon um, on the fuel. It varies uh, based off what the commodities market are doing, based off whether diesel's down, um, soybean might be up. They're, they're disconnected markets. So sometimes they do come into line with each other, even with the tax credit. But the, the majority of the time, um, there is some, some decent savings per gallon. It can be, if you're looking at just B100 to, to ultra low sulfur diesel number two, uh, you can see it upwards of 30 cents per gallon difference on savings. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy and Jim, uh, somebody asked a question about when you're talking about clean air, uh, do you actually have any air quality testing uh, or any data that shows that or is it just more of a subjective assessment by the staff? No, we do actually run the diesel particulate and we monitor NO2, CO in the mine. So there's a huge, uh, yeah, there was a huge difference when we went to the, uh, back to the B100. Uh, AMSHA has restricted the limits too over the years on the, the diesel particulate. It used to be, I believe, 380 or 360, and they've knocked it down to uh, 180 is what the allowable is in the mine. And we're well below that. I think uh, we were, I think our highest we've had has been uh, 90 or somewhere around there. It's pretty low. So it, it, it is better. We do, uh, monitoring uh, daily for air quality. And then also AMSHA comes in and they will uh, do quarterly monitoring for diesel particulate matter as well. Is that something that you guys have reported out or is that just in-house data? It's just in-house data. Great. Uh, so somebody asked a question about you. You mentioned when you switched over back in 2015 to B100 that you had some, you know, some hoses and some fuel filters and, and some maybe some minor changes that you had to make. Um, any other mechanical changes or any other things that you had to do to the to the instrumentation when you went back to, to B100 or B99 or can you talk about that process a little bit? Yeah, no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't have any issues with it. I know uh, I can remember several years back when we started using it at Independent Salt that uh, Caterpillar had some reservations about it at first, but we never had any issues uh, uh, as far as that and mechanical warranties on the equipment, they've been great to work with. Uh, like I said, it's just the initial change when you, you're basically uh, cleaning the inside of the engine out when you start using the soy soy diesel in it. So that that's it. Just a few things. You'll get a few soft hoses. We've tried some different uh, Teflon hoses on our equipment, and that's helped out quite a bit. So... But that's it. It's usually just the first uh, three to four weeks of running it, running the, the product, and then it, it smooths out after that. And do you know, uh, or can you share what type of engines you're using? Are they tier four engines, or or what you have in you this? Have, we've got from everything from tier four on down. We've got a lot of equipment that's being grandfathered in, but the the primary uh, equipment is our Cat R sixteen hundreds, and they're tier four engines. We have, we actually have three of those now that we operate, and then we've got a couple older IMCOs and, and uh, our backhoes tier four. So we it from tier four down, we, we ran it and everything with really no issue. That's great. The other question that was really related to the engines had to do with like your service intervals and that you, you talked about having, um, you know, that, that when uh, the mechanics broke it down, they were surprised at how clean it was and, and what the engines looked like. Um, have you noticed any changes in the, the frequency of servicing or kind of routine maintenance that has to be done between, you know, B, B99 and ultra low sulfur diesel? Well, I tell you, it's, uh, we're real fortunate. Our diesel mechanic we have, he's, he's been 40 plus years uh, working on diesel motors and, and he's real meticulous. Uh, we don't run any of our equipment over the hours okay. uh, as far as services, but the big thing, like I said, we my brother mentioned earlier, is just you can't believe how clean the motors are when you tear them down. It's just it's pretty amazing when you've seen a, a regular diesel pickup, uh, you know, maybe a farm truck or something that has, you know, 150, 200,000 miles on it. And then you take a look at that when you tear it down. Then you take a look at one of our engines, uh, even our little diesel forklifts. Uh, one we had we had one we had to change head gasket on. And uh, I had some pictures. I wish I had them with me today, but it was just 
remarkable to see how clean the engine is on the on the units. But as far as uh, service intervals, I don't think uh, it hasn't. There's been nothing negative, and we're still staying on the standard services as if we were running regular regular diesel. That's great. Uh, one of the questions that was asked is that uh, since, you know, biodiesel can be considered somewhat of like a specialty fuel, uh, and I think you said you stayed local um, with your supplier, did you have any issues finding a supplier when you first started or or was it pretty, pretty easy? No, we never really had any issues uh, finding any. I mean, I think there's Andy's found some alternate ones too, uh, as well, just in case we ever had an issue with uh, our local, but I've never had any problem at all seems like it's pretty readily available if you take a look for it. Yeah, it's because that's usually one of the questions that we hear is that, you know, availability is is a concern. And so if I if I decide I'm going to make the switch, how do I how do I make sure that I can consistently get product? So uh, it's good to hear that you haven't had any any issues. So yeah, we should this year we should run a probably close to 50,000 gallons. I think we were 48 last year and we've, we've ran a few extra hours this year. So we should be around 50,000 gallons of consumption. That's great. Uh, there was a question and, and you may have already answered this a little bit in what you talked about is um, uh, longevity of the engines uh, versus diesel. So I don't know if you've got any you know, data to support that or to talk about that, but um, you know, do you, do you have any uh, speculation on the longevity of your, of your engines switching over to, to buy diesel? Well, I know the older Imcos when we we tore one of those down. Oh shoot, I think it was uh, 2017, and did a rebuild on it, and uh, it the motor looked. I mean, it looked really good from from using the biodiesel. But we probably had I don't know 30 30 thousand hours I think on that loader since the last rebuild. And uh, again, the preventive maintenance helps out a lot, but uh, you know it's hard to say. But yeah. again, it, it just amazes me to see how clean the engine is and how well they perform, you know, using the biodiesel. Well, as I say, you, you know, if you, you had said that you had some pictures not with you now, obviously, but if you want to send those along to, uh, to Ed or myself or whatever, we're going to um, have a recording of this and, and we're happy to, to share those with people that are interested if you, if you don't mind sharing. So. Um, okay. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll look through all my files and reports and I'll, send them your guys way. I'd be happy to do that. That'd be great. I'd appreciate it. So um, question about the fuel quality. Uh, so does, does your supplier, um, do, do you, do you require or ask for any documentation that they um, uh, conform to the, to the ASTM standards for fuel quality? And, and do you have any, you said Caterpillar has been really great in working with you with, um, with your B100. Uh, did you have any issues or anything that you had to do to show them um, fuel quality in terms of making sure that the, the material is still warrantied or still still serviceable? Yeah, I think in the beginning, when everybody started going to the biodiesel, there was a lot of concerns about it. But uh, like I said, they've been really great. And after that, now that, shoot, that would have been, trying to think when I'm getting old, can't remember too much. That must have been like 2007 when we initially started using it at the other mine. Um, as far as documentation, I'm glad you asked that, especially with us falling under the Mine Safety and Health Administration. When they come in and do an inspection and do our biodiesel particulate, do the air sampling, they always ask for a copy of the actual uh, MSDS and the and the uh, breakdown, the purity of the biodiesel, I want to say. Uh, yeah. So the documentation is important for us. We keep that on file as well. So they do want to see that we're actually running the B99. Right. Great. Uh, one of the questions is about your um, used oil analysis. Uh, have you ever done any analysis or looked at the used oil that you drain from your from your machines? Yeah, we do. We do that through Caterpillar Service. Any any it, issues or or comments that you've had from them? They uh, sorry about that. They do always make a note uh, when they send the analysis back. They they uh, put at the top whether the equipment's running uh, the B one hundred or standard diesel. So they do note that, realize that. And there is some difference in the testing uh, as far as the oil when it comes back, but it's nothing major that I, I mean, I would say there's any negative effects whatsoever. That's great. Great to hear. Well, I think we're getting close to time. I'm, I'm happy to, to offer up any other questions that, that people might have, or um, if somebody else wants to ask a question, uh, please feel free to 
uh, either raise your hand or, or unmute yourself and, and um, uh, ask questions of our uh, Jim and Andy from the salt mine. Okay, well, I, I'd like to really thank uh, Andy and Jim for, for taking the time to be with us today. I, I shared with Andy when he got on the call that uh, this may sound strange, but um, actually visiting the salt mine was a, a life-changing experience for me. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to go down there in 2007 when we were considering working with, with bodies at KU, uh, and, and the Soybean Commission was <laughs> enough to get a tour for us to actually um, ride in one of the vehicles and go to the, the face of the salt mine where they were actually mining. Um, and I came home and within a month, I took my family back there. We became supporters of the salt mine. I told every one of my friends to go there. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing experience. So if you haven't had the opportunity to go and uh, now see the museum and everything else and, and see the operation, I would highly recommend it. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty amazing thing to think about being as far down in the ground as you would be if you went to the top of the St. Louis Arch. So um, Jim and Andy, thank you very much for your time. I really, really appreciate it and really appreciate you being willing to answer all of our questions. So thank you. Yep, you bet. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. All right. Back over to you. Th thank you, uh, um, Susan. Uh, we'll uh, move on to our next speaker. Uh, we have uh, um, one of the things that uh, the biodiesel industry is uh, uh, has the dreams of, or uh, yeah, okay. Uh, biodiesel is, a, I got on my wrong set of notes here. So it, it's it's a Monday on a Wednesday today for me. Uh, biodiesel is produced mainly from plant-based oils, uh, soybeans being one of the main sources. And of course, the Soybean Commission does a wonderful job of supporting us on this. And and uh, Andy and, and Jim are talking about uh, soy-based oils and soy-based biodiesel. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the things about biodiesel is it's not the whole bean makes it into soy, the biodiesel. There's other stuff that comes off of it, and uh, those are called byproducts or co-products. And, and uh, uh, if we look to the production of uh, biodiesel from soybeans, there's all these uh, co-products that have got to go someplace. And of course, if they are utilized uh, in some market someplace, that reduces the cost of, of the biodiesel as well as the cost of the, the other commodity, other uh, use of those products. Um, and our next presentation is going to be from Jill Johnson with Cargill, and she's going to touch it on the, the co-product aspect of, of biodiesel. Now, I, I, the way I set this up, I, I covered a, a pretty broad uh, uh, area and, uh, of the co-products being the meal as, as well. And so uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly which direction um, uh, Jill is going to talk, but the co-products could be what we can make from uh, the uh, uh, glycerin and other things that come off the, the soybeans when we uh, uh, are creating the biodiesel. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, to Jill uh, and let her talk about co-products. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, can you see the screen? Well, so far I'm looking at myself. There we are. Okay, great. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk to you about sustainability and, and Cargill's perspective on that. Um, like I usually do when I am um, asked to talk about something, I guess just kind of looking at the subject, you know, what we were asked to speak about and, and the, the word sustainability just means so many things to so many people. And so I just kind of wanted to step back and, and the, the word itself just really means able to sustain and um, doing a little research around some kind of concepts of what that means to people. Um, it can be broke into aspects and one of those aspects um, kind of three of them that I'm going to be talking about and weaving into this conversation has to do with people, the environment, and economics. And I think in the introductory um, material that was for this session, they, they talked about 
um, your wallet and the planet. But we also want to put the wallet, the planet, and people kind of into the view or the scope of what we're talking about uh, for the next few minutes anyway. Um, this sheet here is an overview of, of Cargill, and I won't go into a large amount of detail on it, but I do just want to point out on the very top Cargill's purpose, you know, we exist to nourish the world in a safe, responsible, and sustainable way. And um, breaking that down further, what we talk about sustainability, we talk, uh, we think about it as agriculture is how we will protect the planet and our shared future. And we have some goals around climate change, reducing the supply chain emissions. Um, we have some goals around water resources and goals around land use. And specifically, we are measuring attendance by farmers globally in trainings for sustainable agricultural practices with a goal of 10 million farmers receiving training by the year 2030. So I hope that this will just give you an idea that you can think of Cargill, hopefully as your partner in sustainability, as you think about biodiesel. There's two areas that I'd like to really uh, step into today. Uh, the first one is an integrated approach towards biodiesel and the second one being the sustainable value of co-products. So for starters, Cargill has three biodiesel plants. One of them is in Iowa Falls, Iowa, Kansas City, Missouri, and our newest plant is in Wichita, Kansas. This plant was built in um, and started running in July of 20, uh, 2019. And we had originally um, thought that the plant was being built for about 56 million gallons per year. Uh, we had an engineer that was in charge of the project that had been at both Iowa Falls and Kansas City, and he knew where all the bottlenecks were. And so he kind of oversized the biodiesel plant. So we ended up um, having a plant that's currently running at about 80 million gallons a year, and we still don't really know what the top side is yet. So um, that plant is co-located with a soybean crushed plant in Wichita, Kansas. So um, we have only soy for our feedstock and uh, of the soybeans coming into the plant, 95% of them are locally grown in Kansas. And that's important to us because of that carbon savings of having less transportation with those soybeans coming into the plant. But because our biodiesel plant is actually bigger than our crushed plant, we do have to bring in additional oil and that comes from other Cargill locations as well as other non-Cargill crush plants. And so there is some oil from other states coming into our biodiesel plant. So just to kind of give you an idea of how much biodiesel that is per day, it's about 240,000 gallons, which is like eight rail cars or maybe about 34 trucks. So you can see that there is a good supply coming out of that plant uh, every day. Um, so kind of touching on, um, you know, this integrated approach on sustainability and the idea of people, you know, as well as economics and the planet, um, safety really is a big um, focus for Cargill. In fact, our, our motto is zero is possible, meaning zero harm to employees and certainly to customers. So we are very um, thrilled to report at Wichita, the biodiesel business has not had a, um, a medical aid injury since they started building in June of 2018. And, and due to that, we have really good site engagement that the employees all have a very strong sense of ownership in what's happening at that plant, trying to make it better, um, better product and better processes and, and helping with um, making sure that the environment, environmental impact is as light as possible. Some of these uh, initiatives that are going on Right now, we have a wastewater um, program where we're cleaning some of the fatty acids out of that wastewater and actually reselling them into the market for industrial uses, um, which helps the water that we send back to the city be cleaner. Uh, we are doing steam consumption studies as well as some uh, ethanol procurement um, studies. So all this I tell you um, just to let you know ability at mind in mind as we produce the biodiesel. Um, but, but also that we have a consistent supply of biodiesel available in Kansas. And, and so that's from the supply standpoint, but I also want you to know that, you know, part of that being consistent is knowing that there's demand out there for biodiesel. So it's not just 
a plant that could produce, but there isn't enough bio or biodiesel demand to keep going. So we do currently send biodiesel to many states. Um, here's a map that shows where it's been um, out of our three plants, where our biodiesel has gone over the last five years, for example, just so that you can see it is, you know, something that is national. And, and what supports that sustainable demand is the renewable fuel standard, which is the federal mandate. There are states that have mandates. So for example, Minnesota has a B20 in the summer. Pennsylvania has a B2. We see states like Illinois that has tax incentives for blending and states like Texas that have incentives as well. So that's good because we're not totally dependent on local demand, but we certainly would favor local demand over having to ship it very far. Uh, but just wanting to, for people to know that we both have, we have a sustainable situation now of both supply and demand for biodiesel. The second part I wanted to go into, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of step back um, because of the introduction that um, when co-products were mentioned, not just glycerin. So when we bring a soybean into the crushed plant, we have um, multiple um, uh, products that come from it. The outside of the soybean creates hulls, which is a fiber source in feed. Uh, we also get soybean meal, which is a feed for um, poultry and swine specifically. And, um, and then we also have the oil. And in the case, as I mentioned early at Wichita, all the oil that comes from all the soybeans we can crush there goes into biodiesel production and then some. Um, and so after we take that oil and we put it um, into the biodiesel plant, we add sodium methylate and methanol and that then react that and that creates biodiesel and glycerin, which we consider our co-product. Um, glycerin, and you can see the crude glycerin in the picture on the slide to the left, um, Glycerin in general is odorless, colorless, it's water soluble, um, it's non-toxic, and it's got a slightly sweet taste. Um, it can be further refined to look like the picture on the right-hand side so that it's, it's totally clean and, and able to be used for food and pharmaceuticals. Specifically at Wichita, we do not have a glycerin refinery like we have at Iowa Falls in Kansas City. So when we're marketing um, the glycerin, we have some other types of customers that we work with. So currently um, this glycerin is being used both in the US and Mexico um, in the feed market. So I think this is kind of a fascinating thing to know because there, if you've been around the biodiesel industry for a while, you know there's been conversations about for food versus fuel. So in this case, you know, it's really food and fuel. From that soybean, we get hulls, which goes in feed. We, we get um, the meal, which goes into feed, and we can also take the glycerin and put that into feed as well. So we're not, we're not forsaking the animals, um, which are a food source for the sake of the fuel. Another customer that we sell crude um, glycerin to is a, a water treatment company, and they use it as a carbon source to feed microbes to remove nitrogen water. So we're actually putting this glycerin back into water to help the water become cleaner. Um, so I think that's a super fun tie in to our topic of sustainability. It can also be used for coal dust suppression and um, helping coal not freeze in the wintertime as they're trying to move it. Um, and they also has de-icing properties. Um, we do sell some of our crude glycerin to a company that further refines it into a technical grade of glycerin. And that company makes things such as windshield wiper fluid, um, crop adjuvants. So adjuvants are basically our uh, substance that helps the chemicals that you're going to spray on the plant hold onto the plant so they can become effective. Um, and things like tire sealants. And then if you wanna to take to the next step of refining total re, totally refined glycerin, um, then those products can be sold to the pharmaceutical companies. They can be used in food. For example, Blue Bunny ice cream has glycerin in it. Can be used for paints and textiles, pet foods and cosmetics. So many, many uses of glycerin in its all its varying forms. Um, it doesn't have a huge amount of value, but the good news is it's not something that's being put in landfills and that's going to waste it. It does have a, a secondary purpose, um, you know, once the biodiesel process has happened, um, just as a, a ballpark 
a pound of crude glycerin is worth about five cents. So that means per gallon, it's around three cents. So, so not a ton of money, but it's certainly much better than having to pay to get rid of uh, a waste product. So that um, pretty much sums up what I wanted to tell you about, um, you know, before we get into the questions and answers. But um, I did ask our site manager at Wichita, I told him about this um, workshop and I asked him if there was anything he wanted to share with you um, about biodiesel, about our plant. Um, and, and this is what he said. He said, as we continue to grow as a biodiesel producer, we look to see how we can continue to better serve our customers. The feedback from customers is valuable information for us that we can use to apply to our mission of continuous improvement. As a manufacturer, we are environmental stewards and must do our part to protect and improve our environment. Working together is a way we can achieve our objectives. And while the COVID may have changed things dramatically or drastically, for many, our purpose and goals have not changed in ensuring the safety of our employees and customers on our site and producing a quality product. And that's from Thomas Hill. And with that, I will um, uh, open up for questions. Thank you very much, Jill. I really, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, it was a great, great presentation. I had a question for you that maybe combines a little bit about the production side that you're doing as well as on the co-product side. Um, so okay. when you're doing your process, are you doing a, um, a, a water washing of your biodiesel or do you use a dry wash process um, uh, in the production system? It's a water wash. Okay. So then when you are, when you're talking about the glycerin and the, and the pound of glycerin and the, um, the crude glycerin that you sell, are you selling that as a straight up glycerin or do you guys, um, do you mix it with your, with your wastewater first? Do you try and recover any of the methanol? Can you talk a little bit about the, the process post, you know, post separation from biodiesel? Right. So this is getting a little bit of, above my, my pay grade from the, the, like knowing the super in um, detailed parts of it, but I do know that we do reclaim methanol. Uh, and bring it back. Uh, we have a kind of a closed loop where we'll bring it back in and we'll use it again for the next batch as much as we can. Um, we do um, separate all the glycerin from the biodiesel and we try to get all as much of it out as, of the wastewater as possible so that it is, while it's considered crude glycerin, it is, you know, it's not contaminated with a lot of like wastewater and things like that. Um, and then uh, it, going through a, a glycerin refinery can get it to its um, final refined um, status. Um, so uh, we do have a few waste streams though that we we do sell, which is with basically just waste water. Um, you know, if we can't get all of the um, all of the partic uh, particulates out of it. Um, but if you have any further questions, I'd be happy to try to ask them to one of our operations people too, if I didn't answer that clear enough. No, that's great. I appreciate it. So um, one of the questions says that uh, Cargill is well known as a supplier for soy oils uh, and many edible food grade products. Uh, does the biodiesel revenue stream offer diversity of soy products from Cargill? Uh, and since Cargill no longer hydrogenates soy oils, does this divert soy volumes to fuels as a profitable alternative? Yeah, so that's a great, a big question. Um, yeah, so um, we we definitely got into the biodiesel space back in 2007 when the renewable fuel standard came into place because we knew that soy was going to be used for a feedstock for biodiesel. So we thought what better way to understand the demand than to get in there and actually produce some ourselves. So that was an important step um, I think, you know, if you look back historically, soybean oil was always a, a thing that was in oversupply. We had tanks around the country with, you know, years worth of oil, soybean oil sitting around, you know, waiting for some kind of demand. So this really stepped into that space as, as an important demand feature for soybean oil, in addition to all its food uses. Um, so as time went on and hydrogenation stopped, um, the, the use of soy for fuel has definitely increased and it continues to increase. And we see, um, you know, headlines about more and more companies that are looking at doing renewable diesel, um, big petroleum companies, big users. And that is another question is like, where will all this feedstock come from? And so we continue to see more and more of our soy 
uh, going into the, the fuel stream. However, we this year, if you have been paying attention at all to the, the markets, you see the soybean oil futures and the soybeans are really rallying. And that's really speaking to a global tightening of the vegetable oil um, supply. And we are seeing um, a lot of our um, soy oil going out for exports to other countries, both for food and for fuel. So it's, it's definitely a, a situation that continues to change. And um, you know, we continue to try to you know, stay profitable and stay viable in a market that's changing its need for the product that we create. Um, and then I will just say one other thing that we crush the soybean generally for the meal. The meal is the driver of value on a soybean and oil was always sort of the, yes, thank you. It's kind of a co-product, you know, and now it's, it's taking a little bit, uh, you know, closer of a value stand with the meal, but we still crush to this day for the meal and not the oil um, so that you can kind of get a sense of, of, of the value. And if I remember correctly, uh, Ken Lynn um, from the uh, Kansas Soybean uh, Commission Association um, was instrumental in, in the push for biodiesel from this oil because they had all this oil sitting around from, from the crushing process and trying to figure out what do we do with it. Uh, and, and he was really uh, instrumental in that process. Yeah. Yes. Super. And there's there's some questions that have come up in the chat. They're really more process related, so I might I might save some of those and um, and then get those to you, and maybe you can pass those along to uh, the appropriate person. But um, one of the questions I thought was really interesting is uh, talking about the glycerin refining process, uh, and, and you talked about that there's a refining part of the process at the Kansas City location. Is that something that you think you'll ever add to the Wichita location, or or is that not uh, not on the radar? Yeah, um, it, it's um, been something we looked at very strongly at the time we built this, but because we it was getting a little kind of later in, um, you know, the, the, the development of biodiesel, um, you know, we're already seeing second and third generation ideas, you know, to, to put a, a standard biodiesel plant in Wichita, we were a little uncertain, we knew it was the right thing to do, but to add that extra step of that refining uh, glycerin refinery cost at the time we did it. We just, we really just didn't have that conviction. So we continue to look at it as a possible add-on. Um, so I would say the answer is yes, you know, more to come on that. I wouldn't be surprised if we do. Okay. Um, are there any, you mentioned the, 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 you got the holes basically and the meal, and then you've got the biodiesel obviously in the glycerin. Um, you said the holes basically are going into feed applications. Do you know if there's any other applications for holes or is that pretty much, uh, and, and this may be more of a, of a farming uh, question, but is that, uh, is that the primary application? Are there other things that are being looked at for that? Yeah, I, uh, primary, primarily it is, but one interesting um, one uh, is that they use it in like mushroom production as like to like put help aerate the soil for the mushrooms. So, I mean, I, I think there's, you know, a lot of people that always look at products that are very reasonably priced, right. To look for substitute uses of the best use for a, of a, a thing like that. And, and so certainly um, we are doing that because that's the one thing with hulls is you don't want to stop your, your crushing plant because you can't get rid of the hole. So, um, it's very important to know where you can get get rid of those. So, so there there was a question, and and I'll I'll put a little spin on this, but um, somebody asked about the role of the sodium uh, methylate in the process, and 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 basically from the catalyst standpoint, um, are you do you know if they're if they're looking at um, changes, improvements, uh, modifications to the plant, or is it is it pretty much that this is the catalyst we picked, this is the process we picked, and we're rolling with it uh, in terms of of producing. Yeah, so when we put our plant in, we had a, a Lurgy technology, which is very specific to what we can do. And so, yeah, we, we basically have the sodium methylate is picked and uh, there's not going to be a whole lot of changing of that, maybe changing suppliers or changing how it comes in, you know, tra truck versus rail, um, some things like that. But th that's pretty much uh, solidified for now anyway. Great. And you had you had talked about the fact that I think it was two thirds of the of the oil that you use comes from your your own crushing plant and then you you get it from other sources. Do you ever notice yeah. a difference in terms of the the quality or the properties of the soybean oil that you're getting both, you know, when you, when you have a third of it coming from a different uh, location or, or based on the location that you happen to get it from? Right. So yeah, that's something that we hadn't had to deal with before because our other two plants are fully integrated and, and 
and the little bit that we're not in Iowa Falls, we bring it from Kansas City. So we we knew what it was, right? And so this is a bit of a wild card to, to get that stability factor going. Um, but we do have like maybe three other suppliers that we've we've gotten very comfortable with the quality. Um, one of them is a Kansas uh, crush plant. I, I, you probably can figure out who it is. And then um, a, then a couple others of, that are Cargill within our own system in, in Iowa and um, and then some um, in the Dakotas. So I would say generally speaking, because we're bringing in as um, crude soybean oil, we have the ability because it used to be a soybean refinery at the plant to take out any of the concerning particles or differences in quality without uh, too bad of hiccups. Okay. But we do not, uh, just to uh, clarify too, we do not have the ability to take other feedstocks into Wichita um, with our technology, you know, readily. So we couldn't switch to animal, for example, animal fat, mm -hmm. uh, just randomly. But within the, the soy spectrum, we are able to handle quality spreads. Okay, great. And uh, just to talk a little bit about quality, um, from a fuel quality perspective, do you guys have your own uh, lab for testing fuel quality or do you send it out to have it analyzed? Yes, we do have our own lab, um, but however, we do, you know, go with the, we are working on getting our BQ 9000 certification um, because of COVID, it's been slowed down a lot, but um, our other two plants are, so we have very rigorous, um, try, you know, uh, testing protocol where we go to labs and make sure that we're, you know, aligned. Um, and of course, the seating gets done at, you know, as, as uh, in independent lab all the time, we don't have the ability to do that. So, yeah, we have good lab. That's great. So a question just came in and, and you just you just talked about this a little bit, but uh, maybe a, a little bit of clarification. So you can handle within the soybean oil spectrum. Um, can you handle other things like canola or, soy or, or sunflower oil? So can you handle within the oil spectrum as opposed to the fats or is it pretty limited to just soybean oil? Yeah, so we have done a test at Iowa Falls with Lurgy Technology using a little recovered corn oil. So corn uh, coming from the ethanol production. And we have also done a test in Kansas City with the same technology with canola. So we believe we could do it. It's just that if we were, it's you're really disintegrating an integrated process. So, um, it, you know, to the extent that we have this one third that we have to bring in, yeah, maybe we could look at bringing in a different type of feedstock, um, you know, for that one third. But uh, we're, right now, we're just trying to be as cost effective and efficient as we can. And so to add some of those other variables right now, just it doesn't seem like a good risk reward for us. And canola, as an example, too, generally is much more expensive than soy. So you're, you're not really benefiting. You make it a few degrees in cold flow properties because of the canola, but you're certainly not going to make up that additional cost. Well, and I would think that the Kansas Soybean Commission would really appreciate that one third coming from soy as well. So <laughs> absolutely. And absolutely. Yeah. And and we, we continue to um, ask the, the plant to crush as many as they can. <laughs> See if they can increase that. So, so Jill, I had a question for you. And I'm not sure that you'll know the answer to this. So so please feel free to just use the pass button if you if you need to. on this. OK. Point. All um, right. Thanks. You know, sometimes people ask questions about stability and, and life sh uh, life shelf of the, or sorry, shelf life of the fuel. And, and I noticed that you're shipping, you know, all over the country and uh, in terms of your, your product. Um, when you are using, let's say, soybean oil as your, as your feedstock and you look at your oxidation stability tests, are you all blending um, stability enhancers in your fuel before you ship it out? Do you rely on the, the you know, the uh, racks to do that? Can you talk about that process a little bit? Sure. Um, so each of our plants is a little bit different and it's very strange. There must be something inherent in the soybean that causes a change in natural oxidative stability by plant because um, at Kansas City and at Wichita, we can naturally hit a six to seven hour stability without additives. Where in Iowa Falls, we have to additize. So we additize everything in Iowa Falls. We only additize in Kansas City upon request for rail. And in Wichita, we aren't advertising at all. And, and what we're finding is that, um, that biodiesel, generally speaking, if, if stored, like if there you have like a nitrogen blanket on it, we have stored 
in tanks in Reserve Louisiana for over a year and still been able to maintain an ASTM spec. So, so if you are, if you have a program where you're turning your biodiesel, you know, every week, every month, every couple months, there's really no reason to be concerned if you've got good uh, stewardship on your tanks uh, that that you will lose your um, oxidative stability on the product. And and this is something that would be of interest from a reporting standpoint. So, uh, you know, Andy and Jim talked about when when the the um, uh, mine group comes and they request the MSDS and the and the certification for the fuel. Do you provide do you provide a certification of your fuel prior to advertising and then after advertising, or is it just after advertising? How does that how does that work? Right. It would just be after. Okay. It would be tested at, at, on the finished product. Okay. And we do provide a COA or, or certificate of analysis on every load that comes out. Um, but we we do the um, analysis on that by batch. So the batch could be a tank or a couple tanks, um, but we have a COA for every load. I'd be curious or interested to know if the additives change any of the other products besides just the oxidation stability um, for, for a batch of fuel. I have not heard any comments on that, that, that it does. What, what would be your, your thought that it would change or what would you expect to change? I, I, I don't know. I just, you know, whether or not say like a, a viscosity property would change or, or a mm -hmm. density would change or, um, mm -hmm. or even a, a cold, a cold weather property would change. I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything about that, but I just was, was curious to, to know. Yeah. I'll ask that question. I, I have not heard anything to that regard. So I'll, I'll ask and get back to you. Um, maybe we have time for maybe one more question. And there's, uh, there's one question that's talking about the stability um, uh, adding uh, and it says TBHQ is used for edible oil stability. Are your fuel stability additives of a different kind for biodiesel since food grade doesn't apply here? Um, simply speaking, are there more traditional fuel stability additives that are being used? Um, I don't know the name of our additive that we have right now, but um, the, the TBHQ is familiar to me, but um, here again, let me, let me get that information back to the team here. Okay, that'd be great. So I think we're, we're kind of running close on time. Is there anybody that has a burning question that, that didn't get a chance to ask it um, or wants to, to say something specific for Jill? Great. Well, Jill, I really appreciate your, your time and joining us today. I know we had a, uh, our, our students had a chance to go to the cargo plant. Shoot, it's probably been over a year now and, and really enjoyed themselves. And uh, uh, I, I know every time I get a new batch of, of uh, freshmen and sophomores in the lab, uh, they're like, when can we go to Cargill again? So uh, <laughs> I, I would I would expect that we'll probably be reaching out in the near future to see if we can bring another fresh group of students by because it's always great for them to see uh, in action in large scale what they're working on in the lab. So yeah, that would be great. We'd appreciate that. So thank you very much again for your time. I really appreciate it. And Ed, I'll turn it over okay. back to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jill and, and Susan. Um, I have uh, jackhammers have suddenly started operating here and it's a good thing because of progress is always good, but it's usually loud. Um, our next speaker is from Optimus Technologies. Uh, one of the things that we have always had a, a dream about in the biodiesel industry, and we see it in the, uh, um, the uh, uh, salt mines of running B100, but uh, those of us that are above ground and, and are working in uh, winter conditions uh, would also like to be able to run B100. And uh, it is a little bit more challenging when it gets cold. And uh, this uh, next uh, uh, speaker uh, from Optimus Technologies, Colin Heyer, uh, uh, has a technology for running uh, biodiesel in the wintertime. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, 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 Colin and uh, uh, mute myself because I have jackhammers in the background. Perfect. Well, thanks, Ed, and thanks, Susan, for facilitating. Um, thanks to the Kansas Biodiesel Consortium and uh, and the Soybean Commission for uh, for hosting today. Um, I got a couple slides here that I'll that I'll share. So give me one second. Um, and uh, and let me know 
that should uh, that should be there. So uh, again, uh, my name is Colin Heiler. I am the founder and CEO of Optimus Technologies. Um, we are based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and our uh, company focuses on developing and building technology for the for the biodiesel industry. Um, we build uh, an advanced fuel system for medium and heavy duty diesel engines to operate on 100% biodiesel. Uh, our focus is on the larger equipment and heavy trucks because they're the largest consumers of fuel, uh, single sector consumers of fuel in the, in the country, uh, even though they're the smallest uh, total percentage of, of vehicles, uh, in this case specifically focused in, in on-road, but, but in off-road as well. Um, and, and the other thing that goes hand in hand and, and part of what makes, uh, what makes biodiesel such a great solution for these particular applications is that the ability to electrify or uh, use other uh, emerging alternatives is, is incredibly challenging. The larger, uh, the larger engine size that you, you, you come across and the larger engine size and application duty cycles that, that you're demanding of it. And, and that's where biodiesel uh, becomes a, a really great fit and won't spend too much time here, but, but you know, at a high level, you know, when you're using biodiesel at 100% concentration, you're leveraging all of the advantages. So the slide here shows somebody had asked about emissions earlier. Um, in, in total, there's anywhere from 80 to 100% reduction in the carbon emissions, so the greenhouse gas emissions. That's because uh, biodiesel is derived from biogenic sources. So, um, you know, things like uh, soybeans and, and other agricultural crops or, or waste fats. And those, those beans, as they're growing, they're sequestering carbon, the carbon that, that goes into the crop uh, and that ultimately gets released in the combustion of the fuel is, uh, is biogenic in nature. So the carbon that, that, that gets put into the atmosphere was carbon that was in the atmosphere recently. And so biodiesel has a phenomenal ability to help reduce emissions um, in terms of uh, air quality in the mines. Uh, with 100% a, with a biodiesel, you'll generally see anywhere from uh, 40 to 60% reduction in that diesel particulate matter. And so that particulate matter is, is the toxic uh, air pollutant that causes aggravated respiratory infections and uh, is a carcinogen. So biodiesel does a really great job at, at reducing that. Um, it's also a, a, a very cost competitive and, and depending on the country, the region of the country you're in and, and where you're located, um, you know, those, those economics change, but, uh, but it's, it's very cost competitive, if not uh, able to be secured at a discount to petroleum diesel. Um, easier to handle, safer, a whole variety of, of attributes. Um, so at a high level, Optimus builds a technology that enables the engine to operate on 100% biodiesel while never inhibiting it from operating on traditional diesel as well. So in our uh, fuel system, we are uh, retaining a uh, diesel supply system. So we, we maintain a diesel fuel tank and the diesel fuel filters and supply system, but we've actually added uh, an auxiliary system that's completely heated. And, and that includes a tank and a, and a filter. This is a, an overview of the technology actually mounted on an application. So we, we've got, uh, I'll start in the upper left-hand corner and, and, and work my way clockwise. Um, we've got an auxiliary fuel tank. And, and so for this refuse truck, you can see uh, slightly there, there's, there's actually two filler necks for that fuel tank. So when our technology is applied, we're actually removing the existing diesel fuel tank for this particular configuration. We add a new fuel tank that has two chambers, a smaller diesel chamber and a larger biodiesel chamber. Uh, that enables uh, the majority of the operation, which is gonna be occurring on biodiesel uh, to, be, to be supplied from the larger uh, fuel tank, and then a smaller chamber. And we use diesel for startup and shutdown. And that allows us to operate regardless of ambient conditions or, you know, the climate that the vehicle is operating in. So no matter what, the vehicle will always start up and shut down on traditional diesel. As the engine warms up, we use the waste heat from the engine through a series of heat exchangers and into that heated tank. 
And that allows us to extract that heat from the engine into the biodiesel to condition it and make sure it's suitable for use, again, regardless of what, that, uh, what the ambient conditions are. So um, the fuel system will start up on diesel as the engine warms up. We're conditioning the biodiesel. Uh, biodiesel has a, a small interface that goes in the dash, uh, just mounts into a standard gauge pod. Uh, that interface uh, provides the secondary fuel tank gauge. So it shows you what the fuel level is. Then it also lets you know whether the engine's operating on diesel or biodiesel. Uh, the full fuel system itself is automated. So there's uh, no engagement that is necessary from a driver's standpoint. They're just gonna get in the vehicle and operate it as they normally would. Um, and the system is, is fully automated. Uh, in the bottom right-hand quarter, uh, of the, of the screen is a picture of the processing module. So this is the uh, heat exchanger pump, a variety of sensors and uh, dedicated fuel filter for the biodiesel side. And so that allows a redundancy uh, for vehicle operation, also enables uh, the engine to switch back to diesel in the event that the filter needs to be changed or there's any, um, any uh, operating conditions that aren't uh, suitable for use with B100, uh, the system will default back over to the diesel side automatically. Uh, no, uh, you know, no need, no need to stop the vehicle's operation or anything like that. Uh, operator can be driving down the road, um, and if for some reason the conditions aren't appropriate, it'll automatically kick back over to diesel. Uh, bottom left-hand corner is just the electronic control unit and the fuse module uh, that that gets installed with the technology. And again, uh, the, the full complement of the system gets integrated uh, in a very seamless manner. It's a bolt-on technology, uh, can be integrated into existing equipment and vehicles or spec'd into new equipment as it's being built. Um, the, uh, the kind of variation and the configurations that exist within the system de depend on the particular chassis application. So, um, quickly walk through these slides. Uh, again, these are, uh, in most cases, uh, dual fuel, uh, dual chamber tanks. So we've got diesel and biodiesel compartments that fit into the existing location. Uh, upper right-hand corner is, uh, is a jobber truck. So this is actually a fuel distribution truck and um, we've extended the range here. So we have the full diesel capacity of uh, roughly 50 gallons. And then we've added a secondary biodiesel tank for an additional 50 gallons. So uh, it actually expands the, the total volume of fuel capacity that's stored on board. Uh, quick overview of, uh, of the vector manifold. This is the, the he, uh, heat exchanger and conditioning module. Variety of sensors and, and whatnot uh, are all embedded within this device. Uh, as you'll see, the, the difference between the left and the right component is primarily, primarily the fuel filter. Our technology utilizes uh, the engine fuel filters. So the same fuel filter that you'd be utilizing on the diesel side is typically the fuel filter that we'd utilize on the biodiesel side. And that, uh, that fuel filter is the only uh, preventative maintenance item. So that's the only serviceable component that you have on a regular basis. Uh, so when you do a, a PM, instead of changing one fuel filter, you'd now be changing two. Uh, again, one dedicated for biodiesel and the other for the diesel side. A valve manifold that gets mounted in the engine compartment and that uh, automatically switches back and forth between the diesel and the biodiesel side. Um, and then again, the full system is, is automated. Uh, in addition to the automation, uh, there's telematics and, and fleet integration for reporting that, uh, that the technology uh, seamlessly plugs into. So if you have a backend fleet management portal, you can pull data from the, the Optimus system um, and, and integrate it into your, into your portal. Uh, we also provide uh, a backend portal for engineering analytics, but also uh, calculates operational uh, runtime of the vehicles, as well as the emissions offsets that the vehicle is uh, the vehicles seeing in, in real time. So this is just a sample of the dashboard. You have both uh, vehicle specific information as well as fleet wide data. Uh, tracking the volume of fuel that goes through and, and what the emission offsets that are created by, the, um, by those particular vehicles are. 
Uh, in the event that there were any issues with the technology or there was a service requirement necessary, uh, it would throw a flag, the system would default back over to the diesel side uh, and then notify uh, fleet manager or, or fleet service technician uh, via, the, uh, via the web portal. Um, so a variety of advantages for, for utilizing um, biodiesel uh, in, its, in its pure concentration, but uh, one that, that seems to be particularly of interest to fleet managers is the, uh, the benefits to the diesel particulate filter and, and the exhaust after treatment systems. Um, obviously, every vehicle, every new truck that's specced and equipped at this point uh, needs to meet stringent EPA and California requirements, and that includes uh, particulate filters as well as uh, exhaust catalysts for NOx reduction. Um, the benefit of the particulate matter reduction with biodiesel is not necessarily seen at a tailpipe standpoint for, for equipment that has diesel particulate filters. But where you see the net benefit is the engine out emissions. So the emissions that are being generated by the engine um, are still uh, are, are still taking advantage of that 50 to 60 percent reduction in particulates. So you're offsetting the amount of soot that actually that, that goes into those uh, diesel particulate filters. So the filter itself uh, sees substantially lower uh, soot loading, uh, there's less mass on that filter. Uh, in turn, there's less back pressure on the engine. And, uh, and, and the uh, secondary benefit there is the soot that does accumulate from biodiesel is an oxygenated soot. So it actually, it regenerates more aggressively. And for fleet managers and, and folks that uh, spend their, their days uh, dealing with this equipment, understand that there's, there's, there's different mechanisms for regeneration, for eliminating the soot that, that does accumulate on those filters. Uh, and because of biodiesel's uh, oxygenated, oxygenated nature, it actually spends more time in passive regeneration than an active regeneration where you'd be uh, spraying fuel into the exhaust to, to burn that soot from the, from the engine. Uh, our technology has been applied uh, across the country in a wide variety of applications from uh, smaller uh, pickup trucks, uh, box truck applications to uh, overweight permitted vehicles that haul, uh, you know, 110,000 total uh, gross vehicle weight ratings. Um, so vocational applications like refuse and, and plow to over the road tractor trailers. Um, Focusing specifically on a couple customer use cases, um, Washington DC Department of Public Works is a, is a large proponent and user of, of biodiesel. Uh, they have since the early 2000s used biodiesel in a 20% blend during the warmer months and a 5% blend during the colder months. Uh, about two years ago, we uh, began implementing our technology with, uh, with their fleet. Uh, initially started on uh, on six refuse trucks. So this is actually one of the pilot trucks here. Uh, the technology was a, uh, applied to the to the vehicles. Um, they, they did an assessment and a study over uh, over an 18 month period and uh, didn't find any changes in performance, uh, no impact on maintenance and uh, no reduction in power or uh, serviceability of the of the equipment. And uh, DC, along with you know many many other cities and states, uh, have have set aggressive emission goals and uh, have have made great progress on the light duty side, but have have really struggled to to achieve uh, the the necessary reductions uh, in the heavy equipment. And so um, in in May of of 2019, uh, their director of public works committed every new vehicle that they purchase to be uh, compatible with, with B100. So every new vehicle that they've uh, integrated, uh, every new vehicle that they put out for, for bid, for, for requisition, uh, has the, the bid spec requirement of the Optimus uh, fuel system technology. And so uh, DC today is operating, uh, they've got 23 units that are on the road today. Uh, we're delivering another nine uh, this month. 
And then uh, they have another 107 uh, units that are actually on order right now. And uh, those range in application from uh, refuse trucks like what's seen here to plow trucks for their uh, Department of Transportation. And um, all of these vehicles have the technology integrated. So the fuel system, the truck itself, when delivered to, to DC um, from, from day one, uh, mile zero, will, uh, will be equipped and operating on 100% biodiesel. Uh, DC still utilizes B5 and B20 in their startup tanks. So, uh, so their, their volume of diesel consumption is, is very small in, in, their, uh, in their heavy duty fleet. Similar operations and, and projects going on uh, throughout the country. Uh, City of Chicago Parks District is operating a uh, pilot uh, currently with the Optimus technology utilizing, uh, utilizing the technology in, in refuse applications for their lakeshore uh, refuse collection in, in the parks, uh, in discussions with them now about uh, expanding and doing further uh, further vehicles and different types of equipment with uh, with the city of Chicago, um, you know their parks district and 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 other agencies. The uh, the benefit to utilizing biodiesel is that you know you can plug into your existing infrastructure and existing operations in a way that that isn't uh, you know doesn't require a, a completely new uh, fuel technology. So it's still liquid fuel. Um, you know, it's not like a compressed natural gas or, or electrification uh, or hydrogen where you've got massive investments in infrastructure to tool up as well. So um, the uh, other applications maybe a little bit more uh, in line with some of the folks that are uh, on the call today. Uh, Iowa Department of Transportation uh, initially did a five unit pilot with, with the Iowa Department of Transportation and uh, have, have since expanded that. Uh, they integrated the technology in a bid spec for three new snow plows that were delivered earlier this year and have, uh, have some additional snow plows that are, that are coming uh, equipped with the technology as well. And uh, you know, if, if there's a, a tougher case for the use of 100% biodiesel in terms of uh, application demand and, and cold weather performance, um, you know, throwing, throwing B100 into a plow truck operating in the middle of Iowa uh, during a winter storm, clearing you know, state roads and, and, and local roads that uh, have, have critical safety impacts um, you know, I think, I think the, the, the best testimonial and the best use case is, is something like that, where you can really put the technology to its paces, put the fuel to its paces. And, um, you know, a lot of the traditional challenges with biodiesel, especially as you get to higher blends, are overcome uh, by utilizing our technology and utilizing the, the dual fuel approach. So uh, it, it really allows for these safety critical applications to, to start increasing the, the use of the the blends of, of biodiesel. Um, uh, City of Ames, Iowa, their, their Department of Public Works, uh, again, similar, similar process. And this is how most uh, of, of our deployments and, and most customers, I think in general, uh, most users of biodiesel in general tend to, tend to approach things. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll clarify that, not even just biodiesel, but uh, you know, any type of new technology or, uh, or alternative fuel deployment. And it's not typically a, a jump in feet first into the entire fleet. It's test, do a small use case, uh, and then expand once you've demonstrated success. And so uh, the city of Ames, Iowa started, um, you know, started with a five, uh, five unit deployment in their snowplow applications. Um, and uh, the, basically the, the first week of, of launch with them, uh, they had a massive snowstorm. So the plow trucks were operating 24 seven um, for a day and a half, uh, entirely on, on B100 um, and no performance issues, no challenges whatsoever. And, and we've since uh, expanded the project there. They integrated the technology into 
uh, into their bid spec. Uh, they, they took uh, delivery of, of seven new snow plows earlier, uh, well, I guess later, uh, later in the year in, in, in 2020. So um, variety of different use cases, uh, engine technology from uh, non after treatment equipped to uh, the majority of, of what we work on uh, at this point, which is both DPF and SCR equipped new vehicles coming right out of the factory. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, really a, a broad spectrum of applications from, from, engine, from an engine standpoint as well. Cummins to Caterpillar to Volvo, Mac, um, Detroit, uh, Internationals, pretty much uh, at this point, you know, unless it's, unless it's an obscure engine, there, there's, there's not really an engine that, that uh, we haven't uh, uh, integrated the technology to. Um, you know, as a recap, really the advantages and, and apologies, I've got some background noise here. They're, they're doing some construction as well. Um, the technology enables the use of 100% biodiesel, especially when you don't have uh, those perfect conditions like the Hutchinson salt mine. Um, you know, when, when you've got a, a, a surface application, uh, particularly demanding uh, heavy duty, you know, in cold climates uh, or, or a variety of other, you know, challenges that the biodiesel presents, the, the technology that, that we manufacture allows fleets to deploy biodiesel in a hands-off manner and allows fleets to uh, have confidence in, in the ability to start to blend at a, at a higher level and, and really, you know, jump to that, uh, to that B100 level. Um, we're seeing, again, technology deployments throughout, throughout the country, warm weather, cold weather, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's great for me to sit up here and talk about the technology, but, but the best uh, examples come from, uh, come from users. And so I'd, I'd invite everyone who, who's interested. We've got a webinar uh, coming up uh, next week. It's January 12th. Um, and you'll actually be able to hear, uh, be able to hear from the fleet managers for the city of Ames and uh, from, uh, from Washington, DC. They'll talk about their experience, talk about uh, how they approached evaluating the technology, how they approached uh, biodiesel in general and, and what they uh, implement from lower level blends and, and, and all, all the way up to B100. So um, for information, you can visit our website or, or do a quick search. There's a, a number of ways to, to register and there's a variety of uh, clean cities coalitions that are also supporting that, that event. Um, and with that, uh, happy to, uh, yeah, happy to, happy to take questions and appreciate again, uh, everybody's time today. Colin, great presentation. I really appreciate your time. And, um, we've got some questions that people have asked in the chat. So I'll, uh, I'll try and I'm, I might fire them at you kind of quickly or combine some into, uh, into a couple of questions. So there's a lot of interest. Um, an easy one, uh, was, do you know if anybody in Kansas is using your technology? Uh, today, we do not have any any users in Kansas. Perfect opportunity then. So all of you that are interested, go to the webinar, look at that grant funding opportunities uh, page. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it would be a great opportunity for us to, to have a demonstration in Kansas. So yeah, and I'll just jump jump in, Susan, real quick, and say that um, yeah, there there's a variety of of different funding mechanisms that that will help to pay for the technology. A lot of um, you know a lot of fleets have. Uh, capital set aside for alternative fuels and infrastructure and whatnot. So, um, but there's also state and federal funding in, in most cases uh, to at least help offset some of that cost. And I, if I remember correctly from your presentation at the uh, Biodiesel Conference last year and some of our discussions, it's, it's less than 20 grand if you're doing a retrofit on a, on a vehicle. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, ge generally the the configuration uh, depends on the the particular application. So there's some some different considerations, but but it's it's in in the range of twelve to fifteen thousand uh, dollars fully installed. Okay, okay, that's what I, I thought I'd remember that. So, um, kind of talking about that installation, uh, are there? I mean, obviously the the equipment requires space uh, on the vehicle. Are there are there certain vehicle types or sizes that that work really well or don't work really well? And and have you noticed that the return on investment is different if you have a smaller vehicle versus a larger a larger vehicle? 
Yeah, so um, so I'll tackle the application question first. Um, there are certainly vehicles that are easier to integrate, um, and and that's a function of the equipment. Um, we've got a, uh, you know, I'd say probably the most complicated integration that that we're gearing up to do is on uh, vac truck. So there's you know very limited space. There's a variety of other auxiliary equipment and tanks and whatnot. Um, and so uh, it, some, sometimes, uh, sometimes the engineering uh, is a little bit more challenging, but, um, but we, you know, we, we haven't found an application yet that, that the technology is not suitable for. Um, the, uh, you know, the nice thing about new vehicle procurement and integration is, is you know, most vehicles when you get to the heavy duty side are not uh, they don't, they're not built at one time. So typically there's like two or three different manufacturing processes that happen before the truck gets delivered. And so when our technology gets integrated at that point, uh, we work with the equipment manufacturers to make sure that uh, it's, there's suitable uh, frame rail space and configuration for, for the device. Um, and you, you have a question in there, sorry. No, uh, no, just about whether or not there's a, a, a difference in the economic benefit size of vehicle. Yeah, so so the the overall return on investment is calculated differently by different fleets. You know, there's some maintenance advantage. There's uh, in some cases a, a cost advantage for for the fuel, uh, and then there's also a compliance requirement for uh, you know some fleets have have mandatory compliance requirements for emissions. So depending on how you factor it in, the the fundamental driver ends up being the volume of fuel consumed. So a larger truck that gets used more often is going to have uh, a better economic profile, a better emission reduction. Um, but the overall uh, application is is going to, you know, it'll gen generally tend to be the same um, where where you know the usage is concerned based on a on a volume basis. Great. And, and you had listed a bunch of uh, OEMs that you've worked with. Um, it, when uh, when you have like a factory install. Um, any, any, like, how does the warranty work with that? How does the, the, the um, collaboration work? Do you just send your tech to them and they install it? Do you, do you have people that go to the place and install it? How, can you talk a little bit about the, how that works? Yeah, so, um, so at this point we have, um, we've got a variety of channels and, and generally what happens at a, uh, when the technology is integrated into the specification is that uh, the, the equipment goes to a number of different locations and um, we work with what are called ship through companies. So outside of like the Freightliner factory, I'll use them for an example because uh, we've, got, we've got 30 trucks coming out of the factory uh, next month on, uh, on a project. So it comes out of the factory and they put it in a shipping lot. Um, our partner actually picks up the truck at the factory, takes it to their facility, which is down the road. They install the equipment and then they deliver it back to Freightliner and then Freightliner passes it on to the next, uh, the next company. And so, um, so we typically work with manufacturers um, through a ship through arrangement. We do have a manufacturer we're gonna be uh, hopefully making an announcement on uh, later in the year that's integrating the product as they, as they built the truck. So um, yeah, just a, a variety of different applications, but um, you know, it, de it depends. We can work with body companies. So if they're putting on uh, the salt body and the plow uh, equipment, they could also mount the technology during that process. Great. Uh, so a, a couple of questions about the, the kind of like the switching system and, and the, the fuels. Um, so, you know, you talked about the, tr the truck basically starting up and shutting down on, on diesel uh, and then operating in between on, on biodiesel. Um, so, so when you are uh, using that, is there a difference in the timing of the switching based on whether it's a cooler ambient conditions or warmer ambient conditions? Uh, and also if it sits overnight and it's cool, you know, how do you, how do you know when it's okay to turn it back in when, when, when let's say the body diesel is a usable liquid and, and able to be, to be used? Yeah, so, um, so there are differences kind of in the amount of time the system takes to engage on a negative 20 degree day versus, uh, versus a you know, warmer summer, summer day. Um, but there's sensors and the, uh, there's an algorithm that monitors a variety of different conditions. So it's looking at fuel temperature sensors, it's looking at uh, engine parameters, and um, ultimately making a decision based on um, what type of feedstock it is as well. So a, a soybean-based biodiesel is gonna uh, gel at a much higher temperature point. 
So, um, so a soybean-based biodiesel can be engaged at a much sooner uh, point in the operation than, uh, than say, an animal fat or, or, or some type of uh, used cooking oil-based based fuel. But uh, we're still not talking by, about significant amounts of time. It's, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 minutes, you know, versus uh, five to seven minutes. So we're, we're, we're still, you know, very, very, you know, much smaller amounts of time than, you know, the typical, the overall operation of the, of the equipment. And if I remember correctly, it, all of that is done in, let's say, the brains of the vehicle. So as an operator, I just turn on the, I just turn on the truck or turn on whatever, and it does its thing, and then I turn it off. I don't have to to worry about when that switch occurs or monitoring anything. If, if that is that correct? Absolutely, yeah. And and it could be, um, you know, that switchover uh, occurs once the parameters are 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 met, and so it could be at, um, it could be at, uh, you know. At idle, you know, stopped, or it could be under load hauling, um, you know, hauling, uh, trying to accelerate over a mountain pass. Um, but it'll automatically engage, and uh, operators don't notice any difference in power performance. And the only thing that an operator will notice, which takes a little bit of getting used to, um, but but after you know, after the first couple times, it's uh, it becomes second nature. Is when you take the key out of the ignition, so you turn the equipment off. Uh, the engine will continue to run. And what that allows us to do is, is to switch the system back over to diesel and flush the injectors. So that allows the operator to not have to require, you know, if, if they had to press a button to shut the vehicle down or something like that to switch back to, to diesel, um, you know, the, the one time they forget, you're going to have biodiesel gel in the lines. So it happens automatically. Uh, there is a safety override if they do need to shut the vehicle down. But um, but it'll run for anywhere from 30 seconds to two or three minutes, depending on how cold it is outside. Uh, it just flushes the injectors with diesel and, and shuts the engine down. Yeah. And I think uh, I'll ask one last question uh, selfishly. When, when you get to moderate, you can do this kind of stuff. So, um, but you know, you talked about being able to use B100 in the vehicles and, and all that that works. What um, do you have to do a lot of education, let's say, with the groups who are using your technology on? purchasing B100, storing B100, because it's still cold outside, right? So they're still, um, you know, Ames, Iowa is still having a tank of B100 that they're then putting into the vehicle. Um, what type of education or what type of, of relationship do you have with your users on, on biodiesel storage and, and that before, the, before it actually gets into the vehicle, they're going to use your tech in? Yeah, so um, typically, you know, and, and this is the, the case, whether you're using, you know, a B20 into colder months or, or a B100, there, there's always some level of education that, that occurs and um, that, that's necessary. Um, we work with a variety of different companies, but um, one in particular who, who does a phenomenal job, um, they build uh, heated dispensers. And so we'll typically implement a heated dispenser if the tank's stored below ground, you know, the biodiesel will, will maintain its, uh, uh, maintain its, its fluid properties. But uh, if you have an above ground tank, it needs to be insulated and heated. And um, we also have a technology that bolts onto the nozzle and there's a chip on the tank that corresponds with it. And so it actually won't let the B100 be dispensed into a tank, uh, a vehicle tank that, that's not equipped with our technology. And that eliminates the ability for an operator to miss fuel um, or, you know, any, any number of other challenges that, that could occur. So always some level of education that, that's required. Um, but, but what we found is, you know, especially, you know, from the, from the drivers who get to operate the equipment, uh, they really take, take pride in, in the fact that, you know, they're, you know, out of a thousand truck fleet, you know, their vehicle was selected or they were selected as an operator because, um, you know, it allows them to, to differentiate themselves in there and, and uh, operators notice that the vehicles run better. So. You know that's anecdotal, but um, but they they you know they like they like it so. Yeah, great. Uh, well, I, I really appreciate Colin the time and the presentation. Uh, I know I had uh, one other question that basically is asking for whether or not you're willing to do presentations to let's say technical colleges that that work with diesel mechanics because obviously this is a new a new area that they're going to have to know and be familiar with and everything else. So uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll hook Dan and you up offline uh, to to try and see if there's an opportunity to do that. Perfectly. Yeah, perfect. And we're more, more than happy to, to do so. And, and I'll, I'll take the opportunity for, for maybe a quick uh, self-serving plug here, but always looking to educate diesel technicians and, and mechanics. And um, we're actually in the process right now of hiring. Uh, so if anybody's every, if anybody is a diesel technician or a mechanic that, that's interested, uh, certainly, uh, certainly folks who love biodiesel would love to have you on board. So. Great. 
Well, thanks again for your presentation. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I, I know I've seen seen your trucks and seen some of the work that you've done at the Biodiesel Conference every year. And, and I get more and more excited every time I, I hear the presentation and uh, I wish I could convince the, you know, Lawrence uh, and KDOT and uh, and KU to start uh, putting some of these in their vehicles and and uh, and try and be 100. So awesome. appreciate your time again. So uh, really, really appreciate you guys hosting and anything we can do to help. And, and, and I, I guess I should also send Manhattan, but sorry, sorry for the, the KU plug instead of the K-State plug. So. No worries there. But we've got uh, some K-Staters on that we can uh, convince to maybe uh, buy the technology too. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll go on now to our next uh, 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 speaker. Um, we've got uh, um, uh, Ted Augustine from the 24-7 uh, Travel Stores uh, to speak here a little bit about the, the biodiesel. And, one of the things that uh, two years ago I got to go to, uh, or a year ago, I got to go to the uh, petroleum marketers meeting and uh, um, I learned an awful lot about uh, petroleum marketing on a bus ride from Salina to Wichita to tour the Cargill plant. And I, I just assumed it was a simple process of you just say, okay, let's offer biodiesel and we add it to our fuels and away we go. And uh, uh, in visiting with a couple of the retailers on that trip down, I realized that I, I, I should stay away from uh, making such simplified uh, um, decisions or, or simplified guesses as to how it is to implement something. And so uh, our next speaker is uh, Ted Augustine with the uh, 24-7 Travel Stores. Um, and they have just added uh, uh, biodiesel blends to their fuel offering and, and uh, so we're kind of excited to have uh, Ted speak and kind of uh, talk about it uh, in uh, what went into that decision and, and what they've learned in the process and, and just uh, overall. And of course, Ted spoke a little bit earlier uh, about some of the costing, but uh, uh, Ted, I'd like to turn it over to you and, and uh, uh, have you uh, share your thoughts on, on uh, offering bio, biodiesel blends with the 24-7 uh, travel stores. Sounds good. I appreciate you guys letting me speak today. Um, happy to be on the call. So as I already introduced myself a little bit, so I, you know who I am. I'm Ted Augustine. I work for 24 seven travel stores. Uh, being a retailer, we kind of get to play in a lot of these different areas. Um, so we, we get to talk to Jill a lot. Uh, we talk to Tammy a lot. We get to be storage of the fuels and we retail the fuels as well as burn the fuels ourselves. So we kind of have experience in multiple facets of, of using and storing biodiesel bio along that chain from um, manufacturing to actually consuming and burning that fuel. So I'll speak a little bit to that. I We just got into the game in July, so I won't uh, pretend to be an expert in all things retailing biofuels. We're still learning as we go here. Uh, we've only been in it since July of this last year, 2020. Um, so it's been, it's been an experiment and it's been an experience uh, we recently decided to get into it because of the tax credit was renewed and because Cargill um, finished completion of their plant in Wichita, right? So the economics made sense. The fuel is readily available in our area now. Uh, before, when we looked at economics, trying to get it from Kansas City, it just wasn't there all the time. Um, it just wasn't, we weren't in the money all the time to, to support that kind of investment, that kind of infrastructure. But with Cargill being in Wichita, it made sense. We ran the numbers and, and looked at it and uh, we came up with a concept of putting that mini terminal in, uh, which kind of changed the game for us. Our, our CFO, um, Judd, came up with that, that idea um, to put a larger than necessary tank in at our North 9th site because we have, we have the space to do so. So we put a 25,000 gallon tank in there and made a mini loadout terminal. We got our equipment, um, uh, the loadout equipment and the inline blender from a company called Allline. All uh, which has so far been fairly successful. So that site in particular inline blends. So we haul from Cargill to the Solana North Knight site, drop B99 into that tank. We have a, a ultra low sulfur diesel number two tank there, about the same size and that B99 tank. And then that, that gets fed through the uh, inline blender. So the bio, the bio, B99 is injected directly into the, the same diesel line that we've used since that site was installed and we are able to retail blends anywhere from B0 to um, B20, you know, legally B20 to the customer. So 
Uh, we have to mark that on the pumps and we're, we've, we've learned through, we've uh, gone through all that as well. So just to give a, a brief plug of our company, I guess I will go ahead and just share our image. So you kind of, if you haven't shopped with us before or, or um, visited us before, you can kind of see who we are. Uh, this is our, our website, 24-7 uh, brand there. If you do go to this website, you can visit locations and fuel prices uh, on that website. And it will show you uh, where we are retailing those blends um, and at what level we are, we are tr we're targeting, right? So these are targeted blends. So at Joaquini, Russell, Salina, West Crawford, Salina, North Ninth, Abilene, and Maple Hill, we are retailing bio blends. Uh, hey, Ted, I'm going to, Ted, can I interrupt you for one second? I, I yeah. don't know if anybody else is seeing it, but I'm seeing your email. You're seeing my email, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, let's close that out. Let's see if I can't get this. Now, now, it's your now it's your desktop. Well, that's better than my email. But, you know. <laughs> How's that? Um, I'm still seeing your desktop. Do share. Let's try that again. I will just do screen one then. I tried to share Google Chrome, but I didn't like that. I still have your desktop. Let's see. Stop share. Fortunately, there wasn't anything really confidential or damaging in your email. Nah, good. That's okay. I don't. I don't to keep much on the <laughs> on the subject line. Let's see. We'll give it one more shot, and if we can't get it, we'll move on. Just keep talking. Let's just try sharing screen two then. Is that working? Uh, no, I well, no, I've got a, I've got your desktop with a with a Zoom Outlook plugin pop up is what's showing. <laughs> I do not know why Chrome a, does is, not want to show. Is it a website that you're that is? Uh, yeah, it's a public domain. You want me to send it to you? Yeah, if you put the website in the chat, I'll see if we can get it pulled up for you. Okay. Apparently you need a PhD to share. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Let's see if I can. So I'll just keep talking. Um, uh, that's what we've been doing. We do run four freight liners. So we do have four, four trucks running our own fuel. So we are burning the same product that we are supplying to our retailers. That helps us out a little bit with uh, customer communications. That's probably the biggest challenge. And I've got all, all of our, 10 store managers on the call today that are probably laughing at my sharing abilities uh, since I'm going to lead our team's meeting after this, but uh, that's okay. I'll get a, I'll get a nice ribbing when we get off this call, uh, <laughs> but they are, they have been instrumental to communicating with our customers. That's really the biggest challenge is that customer communication aspect. We got a lot of, uh, a, a lot of loyal customers um, and a lot of people that don't like change. We experienced the same thing when we went to higher ethanol blends a uh, long time ago. Uh, we, we've made it through that hurdle, so we think we can make it through this hurdle. So far, it's it's been uh, more good than bad. Uh, Tammy with uh, Metropolitan Energy Center has helped us get through some of that, offering that uh, that two thousand uh, dollar tax credit or sorry rebate from um, the Kansas Soybean Commission, funded by the Kansas Soybean Commission to fleets, uh, does help quite a bit in, in customer communications. Right, it, it allows you to say, hey, why don't you just give it a shot? You know, see see what it's about, see how it works. Um, know that you can get a dollar per gallon back up to 2,000 gallons if you're if you're a business in Kansas. Uh, you just have to apply through Metropolitan Energy Center, and that helps them helps them get through the first couple tanks, right? So we talk, you know, you hear you hear about switching over from ultra low sulfur diesel to a biodiesel blend. You might experience some fuel filter plugging because of the solvency of that fuel and the, the cleaning aspect of of biodiesel in in a blend like that, uh, we didn't experience that personally. We do have, like I said, we have four trucks that run this fuel. 
we didn't experience any more any more plugging than we normally would, and we actually saw over six percent increase in miles per gallon, um, which is which was interesting. Didn't quite expect that, but we'll take it. Uh, I think a little bit of that's as you get into the winter blends of diesel, as refineries start to bring down their cold filter plug point, that the energy content of that fuel gets a little lower as well. But you tie in the factor of increased lubricity and uh, some of the other benefits of biodiesel, and it's actually helped us gain some miles per gallon in, in our in our fleet. Uh, so she's got that website up for me. You can see our locations there. Uh, those are the locations we are retailing biofuels at, and uh, we're doing that at all those sites through splash blending from that mini terminal in Salina, um, except for North Knight. That's the one that's inline blended. Every other one is splash blended. So we go and pick up um, Cargill, uh, uh, biodiesel from Cargill. We drop it in that tank. When we go to take a load of diesel to any one of those locations you see on there besides North Ninth, we are getting a partial load of diesel from the rack, driving that truck to North Ninth and splash blending in the rest of that biodiesel. Um, we're running B12 right now. Kind of one of the things as a, as a retailer uh, to, to keep in mind and to really keep your eye on is uh, you have to monitor, obviously, your cold filter plug point, right? Um, reputation is everything in the retail game, leaving customers stranded on the side of the road does nobody any good. Um, it hurts the customer and it hurts our reputation. So um, keeping a high quality fuel and a fuel that will run in ambient conditions is critical. Uh, to success. So we don't take it for granted. We do a lot of our own independent testing. So we guess we get uh, sheets from Cargill and sheets from the refinery that show what the properties of that fuel is supposed to be. But we're getting, we're turning those tanks often enough and we switch suppliers, at least on the diesel side enough that uh, uh, we like to do our own independent testing. So we do full samples. We do test it. Uh, we do uh, test just the straight diesel, straight bio, uh, we test blends and we we basically done enough testing to kind of try and find a sweet spot for the different ambient conditions. So we we have our own set of rules um, that I won't share on this call. We've we've done a lot of work on our side. I encourage you to do do that work on your side uh, if you're retailing these fuels and finding that sweet spot of uh, where where the money is as well as um, where where it's safe for the customer, right? So uh, you have to take into account the price of the bio, the price of the diesel, the price of the additive to bring that bio blend into an acceptable cold filter plug point range. Um, should I additize or should I decrease the biodiesel? Those are all questions that, that come into that equation. So it's a fairly um, substantial um, equation when you, when you factor in all those different costs from the components of, of making that blend successful and you factor in the freight to the different locations. So it can get fairly complicated on, on the calculation side. Um, our dispatcher Jeremy Vopat works very closely on that and, and sometimes brings me or, or our CFO in um, Judd to, to help out when that analysis can get kind of tough. Uh, with that said, I will open it, you know, um, I'll open it up to questions. I think that's probably the best from retail side is if uh, we'll just open the floor to questions and then I will provide feedback and, and expand on anything as, as those questions come in. You can go ahead and take the website down too if you want to, Susan. Okay, as I say, I'm going to stop sharing. Hopefully, everybody has, yep. has got the information that they need to from there. And uh, if they need any more of that, they can uh, they can uh, grab the URL out of the out of the chat. So, um, one of the questions that we had uh, is talking about the additives. So, um, you know, so you're getting from Cargill. Uh, Cargill doesn't add any additives in the Wichita facility. Um, uh, so, do you guys do you guys add add additives or additize your fuel? Um, uh, and does it depend on where you get it from uh, in terms of the cold properties as well as oxidation stability or any, any of that other stuff? So from an oxidation stability standpoint, we turn the tanks often enough that that usually doesn't come into a factor for us. Um, we are hauling enough fuel and rotating those tanks frequently enough that oxidation isn't a, is a, major, fa isn't a major factor. We test for water. We're looking for moisture content. We're making sure we're, we're, we're keeping that down. Um, we're checking for microbial growth over time. Um, yeah, we rotate the tanks, but um, microbial growth grows in that layer between the water and the fuel. <clears throat> and so if you get a little bit of water in the bottom of the tank, you, even though you are rotating the tank quite often, you still can, you can still have some uh, chemistry going on down there that you're not, you're not recognizing. And you won't recognize until that tank drops down to a point where it sucks it up and, and plugs your dispenser filter. So we're watching that from an additive standpoint. Um, 
Yeah, we do additize, uh, but we don't additize just a blanket statement. We are looking at ambient temperatures and conditions and additizing from that, right? So uh, we have to manage that across the state of Kansas. It's not just, okay, Salina is going to be below our, our threshold temperature, so let's additize everything. Uh, we're advertising on a site-by-site -site basis. So 10, you're talking about eight, six locations that are doing biofuels, and then you've got still those other four that have diesel. Um, so ultra low sulfur diesel has to be advertised, advertised on its own sometimes depending on the ambient, ambient conditions. So it's managing those blends, um, knowing what those cold filter plug points are expected to be based off our testing and based off the sheets from the suppliers, the, the uh, ASTM sheets uh, from the suppliers, and advertising from there. So we will single treat, we will double treat, um, and we will pull out a bio entirely if necessary. Right. Okay. So that's it's factoring all those in. So Ted, we've got we've got quite a few students, I think, who are on the call and, and maybe some other people who aren't really familiar with the, the retail operation. Maybe you can talk just a little bit about how the process works. So you get the bio from Cargill, you get the, the diesel from, from another supplier, you've got them in their tanks. And I think you said they were like 25,000 gallon uh, tanks that you've got. Um, do you have one facility then where you're pulling out? I know you have inline blending that's going to the to the mm -hmm. nine store or nine location. Um, do you pull from those tanks and make your blend and then truck it to wherever it's going to all of those other locations? So is it pulled from one one retail location or, or how does that work? Or I mean one rack location or how does that work? Right. So each tank, you know, so before bio, um, all of our sites have an underground storage tank for diesel, um, varying in size depending on each location. So they're not all. That's not a, common size, but um, all of our sites have underground storage capacity for number two diesel. Um, what we didn't want to do um, was add a, a bunch of extra costs and, and haul uh, bio, straight biodiesel to six different locations, right? So to decrease the, our infrastructure costs, our capital costs, and to make it make a little bit more sense, because remember, we're only going to blend 20% into that, into that diesel. And so on a smaller site that's not doing a lot of volume, when you put in a big tank like that 10,000 gallon tank, 20,000 gallon tank on a, on a small site, it's going to take you a while to turn that biodiesel. So now you start to add in other factors of um, storing that biodiesel for an extended period of time, monitoring that, you know, watching oxidation. You, you start to play with factors that uh, aren't, I guess, in our, in our wealth of experience. Uh, the, the tank sizes are sized so that they're turning on a regular basis, but have enough capacity for our truck fleet to handle the hauling. So, so yes, they all have underground storage tank um, capacity as for diesel, but we put all the underground storage, underground storage tank capacity at one location uh, for bio. So we only haul bio from Cargill to uh, that one location. And then when we haul diesel to the, to fill up the diesel tanks at the other stores we're blending, uh, we get, go to an, whatever rack. Um, typically it's, it's a rack in Salina. Uh, we fill up with diesel, you know, we fill the truck 80% full of diesel. If we're running a B20 blend and we go and get the other 20% from Salina. Uh, so yeah, that our trucks are making two stops where they normally would make one. Um, but it's at a savings of infrastructure and capital costs. Great. Okay. Um, and you may have mentioned this, I may have missed it, but how much fuel uh, in terms of gallons do you dispense a year um, for 24 seven locations? And do you know, let's say, do you know how much biodiesel you're going through on, a, on an annual basis? I can share, I guess, some rough, rough numbers for biodiesel. I won't share our actual volumes uh, on a 24 seven total basis for, for ultra low sulfur diesel um, or our gas side. Uh, we are a travel center, so we do just we do do gasoline too. So we, we do a bunch of different fuels, right? So that's part of the challenge too, um, is keeping all those tanks full and, and knowing what to haul and when and watching the markets. But um, in the summer, if, if money's good on, on biodiesel and we're running B20 at those six different sites, um, we're hauling on average, I guess, more than a load a day. So um, one of our trucks and Cargill has a max of 7,000 gallons out of the terminal. Uh, our trucks can handle a little bit more than that, but that, that's that's Cargill's uh, policy. So we we can we can do a little bit more than a truckload a day when you just when you disperse that across those six sites that are um, blending in at B20. Okay, great. Uh, there was a, a question uh, that says, is there a way to find out what suppliers are normally providing B, uh, B5 or five percent or less on all deliveries? Oh, so as far as if you're picking it up from a rack on whether it has B5. Um, 
they don't technically have to put that on the on the sheet. Um, the ACM spec does allow for less than five percent. That's considered ultra low sulfur diesel number two. Um, so that's what they that's what they're allowed to call it. Um, we just have relationships with our suppliers and and our dispatcher has a good enough relationship with those terminals that um, we call and ask. Um, we know we know that the diesel we're picking up is um, straight diesel. If if you're if you're looking to blend bio in. Um, and you have a relationship with one of those terminals or racks or, or vendors, who, you know, whatever you're using, uh, and just letting them know that you're going to be blending in biodiesel, that they should communicate with you on whether or not they're they're blending up to B5, uh, because you have a legal obligation not to go over B20, and they know that, and and they want to maintain a relationship with you too. So I don't know that there's any really good way besides just maintaining relationships and asking the question when you're when when you're sourcing the fuel on is it B5 or is it straight ultra low sulfur diesel? And when you had said you do a lot of testing, do you guys do testing in house or do you send your samples off to be tested? We send our samples off. So the additive company we purchase from um, part of our contractual agreement is they provide us a limited amount of testing. Uh, okay. So if we want to go beyond that, uh, we do, we can source it elsewhere um, to put a little plug for NATSO. I guess there's an um, alternate fuels council um, sponsored by NATSO and they have a, uh, worked out an agreement with um, a lab in Iowa to provide, I guess, slim down ASTM testing. So you don't have to go run the full gamut and get a bunch of numbers that retailers don't necessarily look at. They've slimmed down that testing to what a retailer is concerned about um, as far as like water content, microbial counts, oxidation, stability. And, and you know, we don't get into the nitty gritty of copper corrosion and stuff like that. That's, that's ASTM spec out of the rack. That shouldn't change too much. So there is a, if, if you're looking for somebody to get you in, um, so, uh, get you with a lab to do some testing, uh, if you want to become a NATSO member, alter fuel, alternative fuels council member with NATSO, uh, they can, they can point you in the right direction. So. That's great. And uh, a question about your monitoring of your um, diesel tanks. Uh, is it significantly different in terms of the monitoring that you do of those tanks? Uh, or is it, is it similar with just a few extra things for the bio tanks? Right, it parlays nicely, right? So um, testing and, and monitoring tank and fuel quality and tank conditions is definitely something that uh, tripleting 24 seven has ex empirical experience on. And so it's it's not too far of a stretch for the bio, for, for biodiesel. There's a few other things that maybe we're a little bit more concerned about than we would have been with other fuels. Um, like we might go ahead and pay for an oxidation stability test for biodiesel uh, just because it does oxidize quicker than um, ultra low sulfur diesel. We have found that we turn the tank quick enough that that's really not a problem. Uh, we'll ask for microbial counts where we might not ask for microbial counts on every um, ultra low sulfur diesel um, sample. So it's tweaking that knowledge a little bit, but it's it's very much in the same avenue. Okay. And, and I don't I don't know that you'll have any indication of this yet because it's it's relatively new, right? In terms of of coming into the market, but. Um, What's your what's your gut feeling? What's your your perspective on consumer interest? Uh, you know, in terms of the bio space. I mean, do you do you hear things? Are you getting feedback? Are you you know what's your what's your gut your gut reaction? I think our niche is a little tougher um, on the consumer side of things. Uh, when you talk about sustainability goals, and you know, we had Jill talk, and we had um, um, uh, Optimist talk, um, and, and they have much broader, uh, I guess, much bigger bigger goals. Uh, because their customers do. Uh, so when you talk about bigger fleets, they they have a, a public interest, especially if they're a publicly traded company, to show sustainability, to show that they're driving towards there, even if it's not in maybe the, the best interest of the bottom line. Um, and so they, they have a public perception uh, aspect of that that helps drive that and it helps drive acceptance from maybe the larger side of things. Um, those customers don't necessarily fuel with us. We have a lot of uh, grain haulers, a lot of um, um, cattle haulers, a lot of uh, smaller fleets, one, one, two, three, four truck operations um, that don't have sustainability targets to meet, that don't have expectations to meet. You know, they're, they're trying to put food on the table and they operate with what they know and their, their wealth of experience, which is a lot. You know, it's not, you can't discredit that. They've, they've run a lot of gallons and they've run a lot of miles in their trucks. And so they have certain expectations, um, which might not align with uh, 
biodiesel expectations. So we have a little bit of, uh, I guess, a tougher time trying to sell that to our customers. Uh, we have had success. You know, we do have some customers that are, are having good experiences on it. Um, but it's challenging, challenging our customers in the right way, I guess, is a challenge. It is, is the task at hand, right? So when, when they come in with a complaint and they, why are you putting that in the diesel fuel? What are you doing? What are you doing to my fuel? Um, and having and, and getting our team on board with, uh, with selling that, right? So we're salesmen, we're retailers. That's, that's what we are at the end of the day. And, and I think we do a pretty good job about it. And I think we've retained most of our customers. We've probably lost a few. Um, to some other independents. But uh, if you look a little for more forward thinking in the process of uh, if the biodiesel tax credit is going to continue to extend it and more and more marketers and retailers are going to be in the biodiesel game and ultimately it reduces their costs to stay competitive on the street, keep your sign price competitive, you, you're going to end up in, with biodiesel in the tank at some point. Yeah. Um, and, and that's good. I mean, it's, it, it, I'm sure the consortium loves to hear that. And yeah. we, we don't mind, right? We're, we're in, um, and it's been a good thing so far. So. Yeah. And I think, you know, some of the things that we've talked about and, and, and some of the questions that, that have been raised are, you know, the, the education, the marketing, right. The, the, the continual um, uh, discussion about it and, and trying to, to help the public and, and different people understand um, not only the improved benefits of it, but the the, the economic opportunities and, and all the things that go into it. And um, I like Michael's comment about if you can get five dollars for a Starbucks cup of coffee, biodiesel has a bright future, right? Uh, you know, I, I always tell my students that if you're looking at, you know, I can get I can get students and, and people that are go into uh, Bath and Body Works and spend, you know, fourteen ninety nine on a bottle, small bottle of hand lotion, but they'll they'll have a stroke if uh, if gas is two oh nine at the pump, right? So right. Uh, uh, it's a uh, it, it's an interesting world we live in. So. Yep. Yep. Commodities marketing is, is a bit of a game is, is a different animal. Um, yeah. it, it's customer education is part of it. Uh, but it, it only goes so far. It what will really change the game and, and where the market's headed is, um, status quo, right? So the more people that have it, uh, the, the more they interact with it and the more it becomes the norm, the easy it's going to, the easier it's going to be. So we're a little bit on the front end of that, but but not really. I mean, uh, some of the majors have been in biodiesel for quite some time. So I think we're in the right spot in that transition. Well, I, I uh, Ted, I really appreciate your time and, and your presentation. Uh, it was it was great um, to hear your perspective and, and hear everything that you're doing. And I applaud 24/7 for for you know jumping in and uh, and and helping uh, helping out with this discussion. Uh, I think this kind of leads into, and, and Ed, you can correct me, but I think it, it really leads into or segues into our last um, our last uh, area, which is really just a roundtable discussion. Uh, and I encourage people to to turn off your mics and and ask questions. We we kind of wanted to think about what the industry needs to be, you know, economically sustainable, environmentally sustainable. You know, what are the things that the consortium can can work on for the future? Are, is it an education? Is it you know, are there are there additional types of speakers or case studies or things that that this group would like to see uh, to really try and help uh, help drive this industry um, forward and in, in, in particular in the state of Kansas and in the surrounding area. So, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing uh, people thoughts and, and, and questions on those topics. Yeah, yes, yeah, Susan, this is the round table portion of it. So, uh, Please uh, don't be bashful and uh, ask questions as you, you can. Uh, I will probably mute myself here because I have some construction going on in the background, but uh, uh, I encourage everyone to, to answer the, ask questions of any of our speakers or any of us. Uh, and here, this is an opportunity to, to talk about different uh, things. And I'm going to take a minute. This is Tammy Alexander from uh, Central Kansas Clean Cities. And Colin had mentioned about the funding uh, that, that's helpful for the equipment. Uh, we, we have funding too that helps with uh, biodiesel installations, different things like that. Uh, but that's something they can certainly reach out to us for uh, to, to hook them up with different funding opportunities that are available. We are going to have one coming up, uh, Diesel Emission Reduction Act funding. Uh, that should be coming up soon that would be able to help with uh, some of that biodiesel technology for the Optimus equipment. Um, but certainly reach out to us. Uh, you can find our website metroenergy.org 
is our website. And if you go under get involved, you can sign up for our newsletter. And when those opportunities become available, they're always in our newsletter. But you're certainly also welcome to reach out to me. And uh, I will put my email in the chat. So if you have questions, we'd love to help you out with that. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just uh, echo Tammy's comment there. The the DERA program that's that's opening up soon um, has helped to fund uh, projects uh, in DC with the Iowa Department of Transportation. Um, uh, we've got two projects in DC: DC Public Works as well as DC Water, um, who've both been recipients of of DERA funding. So that's a great avenue to to leverage. There was a, a question that was put into the uh, chat uh, kind of directly to me, and, and I don't know, this may be a question for um, maybe a question for Jancy or for, for Dennis uh, uh, Hoopy, uh, but the question is how much does biodiesel increase what the farmer receives for soybeans? So what's the impact of biodiesel on the actual um, soybean market and the soybean farmer? I don't know if somebody wants to jump in and try and answer that question. Well, it's not my area of expertise. This is Mike Balumo, but I'm a K-State grad, but I, I like you. My son went to KU, so we're even. Um, I think it's supply and demand. Um, if, if whatever your raw material source is entering the market and depending on supply, um, that drives pricing. So Cargill had, when, when I was there, I'd worked there as a, a soy operator. Um, we had the commodity guys and you're looking at futures based on what is consumption. And so uh, biodiesel feeds into that. You're pulling some out, but I think, you know, you know, edible is certainly where the world is. And so if you want to try to drive, you just basically look at what you're producing, the quality, and then who's willing to pay what for it. And like we have seen with oil, oil's gone down to, I don't know, 10 cents a barrel and now it's up over 50. And it's just one of those cyclic things. So in, in I look at biodiesel and what we use for the fuel segment here is one of the smaller offlines of the general consumption of this commodity. And the more we can find diversity, as you mentioned with your cargo question, canola, corn, you know, I mean, you know, we're relying on <clears throat> soybean because it's plentiful and it's, it's a self-driven Midwest thing. But in the future for bio, I think to look forward thinking and saying what other sources who's develop, developing them. And at Cargill, my experience there is, um, my dad was a second war veteran, so I'm kind of frugal. <clears throat> and I kind of look at Ted and, and Colin, you know, it's all utilization. Everything is money in the end. However, um, to, to use and recapture things that you've been throwing away, which Cargill is doing, you know, that's basically the soy was garbage from the meal production for feed. Find a way to sell your garbage and you make money. And so as we utilize better methods of making really clean, usable energy sources, that's where the magic is. And, um, you know, I'm going to just say that everything, you know, on the football field, my wife's a Steelers nut, um, Glam sells. Starbucks doesn't get five bucks simply because it's good coffee. Everything that surrounds it from, you know, their stewardship of the earth, their employee benefits, they, they capture and a scientist and an engineer are not going to light the world on fire with statistics on soy. That's the background, Ted. You know, you're smiling. That's the realism we all face. But to give soy fuels or, or biofuels, I don't care what waste stream it is, Cargill, chicken fat, you have to make it more sexy. And I don't mean that in a gender sense. It has to be attractive visually with marketing. And you have to kind of push aside, you know, the economics of um, – exhaust emissions and benefit to you know equipment that's an operational technical thing that business managers worry about you give it a face that people want to come to and you might have to spin it with the green alternative and things that as as jill alluded to stewardship and if the council kind of looks at how to capitalize that which is your goal um susan with with students you know use young minds to be creative in a way that they're not in a box where we've come from as graduates and your discipline is engineering or agriculture because you know we come out of these institutions as boxed people and let the creative minds find a way to put a spin on it that makes it more attractive because when starbucks started it was one location with a small vision and who would have thought that they could have grown to this extent but it's a slow process but it's like a yeast culture since ed i'm a beer 
connoisseur too. And these cultures start slow, but when they take off, they they go to the ceiling. And that's what you're looking for in this in this, you guys are on the cusp of, I think, a transforming industry. I look to renewable energy more favorably than I do electric vehicles and things where the infrastructure isn't there. But this is gonna really fall on time, a platform where you can find a way to make it more receptive <clears throat> and kind of strip away the, the technical aspects because that's not really very attractive um, and dress it up in a way that uh, uh, allows people to feel like they're helping the United States or the world stage. You know, anything that we do, infrastructure included, and people are very uh, patriotic. You know, if they feel like there's a cause behind it, um, they'll buy it. And I think that's the next hurdle that you can approach through the younger minds to find a way for the marketing side. Because I think technically you guys have all nailed the product itself, the economics. I mean, that's what we balance every day in the office. Uh, but just find a way for the marketing to be a lot more catchy and creative because that is what returns people to every location where they're addicted to one thing that they'll never give up. My wife, it's it's the Steelers, you know, and Ed, it might be Starbucks coffee. And, and for me, it might be McDonald's hamburgers. But once you build that, it's, it's a lifelong association with patronage to that product line. Hey, Susan. Yeah, I, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Sorry, right, Susan. This is Scott Fenwick with the National Bodies Award. So I, I think I can help answer that original question. Um, but let me first say, I serve as a technical director, and so I, I don't often watch prices, but we do quite a bit of, of economic analysis as well here for the industry. Um, keep in mind, you know, the biodiesel industry is over 25 years old, hadn't always been commercialized to the extent it is today, coming up on 30 years. You know, we were first developed uh, because the oil side of the bean was really a drag on the protein prices. And so farmers got together to figure out alternative uses for soybean oil. Uh, our last economic analysis a couple of years ago shows that because of the biodiesel industry where the volumes are at today, uh, contributes, I think, between 13 and 15 percent uh, of the basis of a bushel of soybean today. And as that biodiesel volumes increase, uh, so should that contribution to price. <clears throat> because then you'll start to see decreases in carbon intensity and additional reasons, you know, uh, decreases in greenhouse gas emissions that'll lead to biodiesel being an even higher value added product into, into transportation fuels and diesel fuels today. So about 15% of the price of a bushel of beans today. Great. Thank you. You know, uh, I, I want to ask um, one of the questions that we've had in uh, in workshops in years past, or or kind of the issue that's been been brought up is is availability and access, right? And um, you know, if I'm in if I'm in Lawrence, Kansas, and I want to use B20 on a regular basis, or I want to I want to get some uh, Optimus technology in my my um, you know uh, refuge trucks, and I want to use B100, it's it's access to 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 fuel. Um, Maybe we could have a little bit of a discussion about that, of what access looks like now in Kansas, and and you know um, how easy is it to get to, to get access to, to B20 all the way up to B100, you know, from you know, East Coast all the way to, to West Coast of or, or West boundaries, let's say of uh, I wish we had a coast uh, boundaries of of Kansas. Just interject really quickly here. If you're looking for biodiesel locations or, or any fuels for that matter across the country, um, you can go to the Alternative Fuels Data Center um, and that's afdc.energy.gov and I will drop that in the chat as well. But they have a station locator and so you can put in there what you're looking for and it'll find it anywhere across the country and into Canada too, I believe. So that's one way that you can locate uh, and those are going to be retail stations. Um, you're not going to be able to find a rack supplier through that. But if, uh, you're, if you're looking to purchase alternative fuels retail, you can find them there. Great. Um, and I, I don't have direct experience in, in Kansas, but I'll, I'll chime in on the availability. Um, one of the things that, that we've found, and, and certainly our, our customer base is 
uh, mostly focused on fleets that have fueling on site. Um, and, and what we found is, is most of our customers are, are actually pulling product directly out of the plant. Um, rather than, you know, in some cases there's partnerships with jobbers and, and, and distributors. Um, but there's a, a lot of opportunity, uh, when you're, when you're eliminating the need for, for blending, if, if there's a B99 product available at the, at the plant, uh, consumers can get direct to, um, you know, direct, uh, to the sourcing relationship. And so, uh, if they're procuring fuel, uh, on, on a regular basis and have capacity for a truckload, um, it, it, ultimately makes the logistics a lot, a lot easier and the availability a lot, a lot better. So again, I don't have direct experience in, in Kansas, but that's how uh, a lot of our projects throughout the country are working. Thank you, Carl. You know, Scott, I've got a question for you. So I'm not hung up on marketing because I'm more technical than after three cups of coffee, but you know, we've got off-road fuel dyed um, in, in, anything it's really appearance uh, you know until you had a engine coolant become different colors um, you couldn't get premium for it because it was all the same color so i wonder is it technically and legally feasible uh, for if you had green fuel you know a, a b blend which is earth friendly if there's a way or there's uh things that would recognize because when i put something in it's all the same color is it a B2? Is it a B20? I learned something today and that anything less than a B5 doesn't have to be revealed. So you're getting something that you don't know. It's almost like MSG in your food. If you don't like it, but you don't know you're getting it. So are there areas to examine that, you know, we can find ways that the value, the benefit, and it could really be a little more recognizable because this is kind of stealth technology. And I don't mean that as a negative, but it's not easily recognizable. And I think when, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all of you out here, Susan, you're wearing something that says KU, Ed, you're my favorite wildcat. We have colors associated with that. If I had purple in the office, you know, I was a K-State grad, but that's how you recognize things. And so is there something in the future, um, we use a little bit of the symbolism, you know, a little green leaf is squeezing a drop, but is that something now, because that's receptiveness to public. Um, we're talking about the economics, which is great. Economics will only launch it so far and, and we all recognized here, once it becomes the thing to do, you know, if, if the next president um, waved a flag and said, I love this, half the nation will probably buy it. And so we're at a really a cusp of technology changes, investments by industry like Cargill, that we've got a lot out there, technologies like Collins, that it's waiting to, to break through and hit that, you know, unlimited uh, potential. How do we move that needle? That's kind of my question, and I don't mean to be long-winded with it, but I think that's the area that we're all kind of searching for, which will drive this so that that sled is pulling us through the snow and we're just trying to hang onto the rope versus us trying to make small incremental changes and move the needle a little bit. No, and I, and I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, unfortunately, as far as a, a dye for fuel, it would not be legal uh, to use any other color. There are there are yellow dyes, there are blue dyes, there are green dyes that are used in other types of fuels. Uh, and because of the off-road red dye that's utilized, uh, it, it would not be a legal circumstance to use any other type of dyes. The, the B5 issue um, is, is true. Technically it's 5.49% of a gallon contains up to that percent. You don't have to label it. Uh, no disclosure required on a bill of lading or product transfer document, as Ted knows. Um, and then there's, and we work in these ranges for a very specific reason, and I'll get to that. B6 to B20 requires a pump label, uh, as Ted, Ted mentioned, uh, but there's that range. And so that allows 24-7 or, or any other retailer to, to fluctuate that blend level. So yeah, the consumer may not be getting B20 every day, every load, every you know, car full, but that gives the retailer some flexibility that, hey, if, if it works in his favor economically on Monday, it's B20. If, if, if there's a cold front come through on Wednesday or prices shift, he can, he can put you know, a load of B0 and drop it in that tank without having to change that pump sticker. If he's pulling a load a day and has to monitor the biodiesel content, 
And the reason I say that, it's not illegal to sell more than B20, but the labeling requirements change. So once you get above 20%, and again, roughly 20 and a half, then you've got to be, rather than a range, you've got to be within plus or minus 1%. So he might have to go out and put a label on there that says B22. And, but oh, price change tomorrow. And so he's dropping B0. Now he's got to go pull a sample from his underground tank, have it tested. He's got to change the label. Well, wait a minute. Temperature is going to change again tomorrow. Uh, he's, he's sticking his tank once or twice a day to pull a sample for biodiesel content. And by that point, his station manager says, to heck with this, get away from biodiesel. Because that time and effort even though it's not a significant cost, it's just not worth it. Uh, and, and like you said, it, it comes back to being a marketing issue. And so we work on that range. Uh, it allows pipelines and, and marketers a lot of flexibility, even though we're all sitting here saying, hey, I wanna know that it's B20. I wanna know if it's B2, B5, B7, B12, whatever the case may be. Providing that flexibility to the marketplace is an even greater advantage sometimes that we just don't understand. Yeah, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll chime in on that. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that, right? So we put stickers on in July, the same stickers on the pump, right? So we're now in, in January, I haven't had to pull it off yet. So um, it does provide you enough flexibility to be able to manage those cold weather, cold weather properties, be able to keep bio blended in, uh, which, is, which is a major advantage, I think, for everybody. And it allows us to, to not have so much logistics associated with retailing it at the pump. We do try to offer some transparency uh, by putting it on the website, which is why I wanted to show that. So when, when, we, when I put B12 on the website, that's what we're shooting for. Um, it might be within, you know, it might be B10, it might be B13, but we're pretty dang close to that B12. And, and that's our goal is to, be, is to provide the transparency there where if somebody wants to find it, I mean, it, it's out there. Um, we're not hiding it. And we don't intend to hide it. Um, you know, we're in the process of uh, making a, 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 a stickering our 50-foot truck with biodiesel on the side, right? So we got a, we bought a whole new insulated trailer so we could continue to pick up uh, biodiesel through the winter from Cargill. Uh, so we're in the process of branding that and making making it flashy, right? We're 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 trying to do that side of things. Um, it's just finding the right niche for that, and and we're experimenting with it too, right? So we don't know what's right and what's wrong. We're feeling our way through that. Um, we're trying to get, you know, just, just one piece that we like to use is, like I said, our, our niche is uh, a lot of smaller operators and tends to be a lot of grain haulers. So what better than to talk to the grain haulers and say, hey, this is in your vested interest to burn this fuel. The better the grain price, the, the more you can charge to haul that fuel, the more, the more grain out there to haul. So um, it's, it's, kinda, it's targeted marketing and it's also broad marketing. It's trying to find where, where that is. Um, I am an engineer by degree. I did get stapled with a marketing manager somewhere along the line. So uh, I'm figuring that out as we go. Definitely not my, my bailiwick, but we're, we're learning. So It's amazing, Ted, how much spreadsheets are not good marketing tools, right? No, they're not. <laughs> you know, Ted, as, you mentioned, uh, as you mentioned, the trailer labeling, I think that's excellent. And coffee creamers, many have... Um, corn and possibly soy solid. So you might want to put a picture of Starbucks coffee next to that. And, and uh, even though they don't like biodiesel, you're going to get those caffeine addicted people out there to be buying your product. I'm, don't laugh, Susan. You never know what's going to fly that kite. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm laughing because I, I agree with you on the fact that you never know um, what, what, what attracts people. So Max, did you have a question? Uh, uh, I don't have a question, just a thought like you guys are talking about, like everyone's talking about marketing side of biodiesel. So uh, my thought is that um, a lot of people are not aware of that biodiesel is a thing. Like even my engineering friends, like every time I tell them what I do in my lab, I produce, I convert hemp oil to biodiesel. They are like, oh, that's so interesting. Like I, I don't know about it, can I use it in my car? So I feel like this uh, industry is lack of like exposure to the public. And uh, I don't know what uh, the current marketing for this uh, industry as a whole is. Maybe there's already some awesome marketing out there, but like, I feel like, so I feel like there's like some audience out there, like they can't even solve math. So if you 
you pitch them this like very technical you know advantages of biodiesel they don't care but what they care is i think they care if we if we as industry as a whole not just individual company to market biodiesel this industry and we target on clean green renewable and recycle like some some people they recycle waste cooking oil and if you market like we recycle waste cooking oil turn into fuel people will buy that like I was listening to another uh, workshop um, from my university and uh, it's really interesting that one of our professor, he was like people in California, they would spend so much money to uh, buy electric car and fuel because they think it's, they think it's, re they think it's green and renewable, but in fact, um, they use fossil fuel to make electricity <laughs> to fuel the car, but they don't care. They they would like spend so much money just to buy the green concept. So I feel like from marketing standpoint, it's more like, I don't know if you guys seen the movie Inception, it's like you plant a concept into customer's mind and then slowly it will grow, um, expand this idea. And I think people to educate the public and then they will like, I think this is a better way to market Bob Liso, this industry as a whole to public. Well, I think uh, Max, a lot of what, what Scott's, you know, what the um, National Biodiesel Board has been doing has been trying to work on that education piece for, for a long time. Uh, I think, you know, some of the things that we've been trying to do with the consortium is, is really trying to target students uh, and trying to target um, even, even the younger generation Right, so that that as they as they grow up, they become familiar with it. It becomes something that's in the vocabulary. It's not it's not a surprise to them. And I think it's a lot easier when we can start earlier on than when we're trying to to start with somebody who's, you know, as old as I am and trying to to change their ways. So, um, so I, yeah. I I agree with you that that uh, education that's really important in the marketing and and starting early is something that we can we can do and and having opportunities and case studies for people to see. Right, to be able to go to the salt mine. And see it in, in operation or to be able to you know uh, see a truck go by and have the optimist technology on it and, and understand that, that that these are these are you know common practices now and not uh, not um, you know advanced tech that is uh, is um, something out of a out of a sci-fi movie so any Susan, other any other thoughts or questions yeah Susan can you hear me this is Jeff yeah. The, yes, the reason for my the, the reason for my five percent question from a fleet perspective and the fact that the state has a requirement that we run two percent bio and we're taking bids from around 130 different fuel suppliers around the state i don't want to be asking for two percent bio or, 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 or any percentage of bio when my a lot of the mom and pops that we buy from don't know what's in the fuel, so I don't, I don't want them putting too much adding to it because they don't know what they got, and that, that's the frustration from the fleet side. Is if our vendors <clears throat> that we get bids from don't know what's in the fuel, but we're telling them they need to add some, they just add on top of what's there, and potentially in wintertime, that's a problem. That's that was the reason for the question. Uh, just, I mean, we, we've had one, uh, right, the Coffeeville told us they're doing it, you know, and they're, they're doing it for the, uh, the points or whatever they collect, but, uh, but it is, it would be helpful for fleets or people that are, you know, fueling, you know, we're getting fuel at a hundred, about 120 sites around the state. We need to know what we're putting in our tank and it, it's it's frustrating when you start talking to the fuel suppliers and they do not know what's in the fuel that they're giving you i mean they don't sometimes they don't even know what additives are in there a lot of times they don't so that's a that's a frustrating thing from an end user i guess right and not every not every not not every retailer is created equal um they all operate a little bit differently so um all I can do is speak from our, from our side. We, we do verify where our diesel comes from. We do know if it's B5 before we put it in the tank and we, uh, are, we are blending to a very specific number. 
and managing those cold filter plug point properties, right? So we're, we're advertising um, and, and pulling out a bio as necessary. And we've only had to do that a couple of times this winter. It has been a pretty mild winter. So it's been, been a good year to, to get into it. But yeah, it's a challenge. Um, not every retailer is going to know exactly the quality of diesel they're, they're procuring and putting in the tank. They, they are, uh, um, some, some are not that sophisticated. So that can be definitely a challenge if you're f- f- filling at retail sites and not purchasing the bulk fuel directly. Yeah. I did have another question for uh, uh, da, 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 Colin on the, on your system. Uh, one of the challenges we have on our fleet is a, a, a fair amount of high, low, low load, high, or, you know, idle time where we're not on the newer engines, we're not building enough heat to, to burn off the, uh, the carbon off our after treatment as efficiently as we could. And we're, we're starting to see some effects of that in repair cost. And I'm curious if you got any data that would, for the, the equipment that you've been running 100% bio, if, if there are any cost savings in repair, uh, you know, in, in after treatment systems, I mean, you, less, you should in theory have a lot less soot so that there's, there's potentially repair savings there down the road. I don't know if you've seen anything on that or not, but that would be something yeah. that would be interesting for, for to a fleet like ours. Yeah, there's there's a couple a uh, couple net advantages. One, um, you know, substantially less soot, so you have uh, you know your your interval for for regen is is in some cases going to be extended. Some some cases they're they're time based, not uh, not differential pressure. So so that'll change depending on the engine strategy. Um, but because the soot oxidizes more aggressively, you're going to end up, especially you know, I mean, the a, a plow truck uh, is going to be you know used hard when it's in uh, snow removal operations, but, you know, for asphalt, you know, you've got a lot of start stop, um, you know, ton of idle time, you know, not exactly the same, but, but very representative of, uh, of a refuse truck uh, duty cycle. So you get a lot of idle, um, you, you do tend to just generally see higher, uh, higher soot build up. And so with, with B100 seeing that reduced, seeing a better oxidation uh, strategy on the, on, the, on the filter itself. And then, um, and then with biodiesel, you do see slightly higher um, exhaust temperatures. So, um, so all of those things end up uh, providing a, a net advantage. And we've got a couple of fleets right now that we're doing uh, longer term studies on uh, comparing to their, to their diesel equipment. Um, to, to demonstrate what that, you know, what that looks like from a techno economic basis. But, um, but yeah, all of the challenges y- you, you talk about are experienced across the board with, with fleets and, and, you know, there is a, there is definitely a, an advantage when you're, um, you know, when, when you move to a higher, higher biodiesel blend. Great. Well, I think Ed, we're, we're right at, uh, right at time for the, the workshop. Um, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, but, but right before I do, I just want to say thank you very much to our presenters. Uh, thank you to everybody who participated. Uh, I was really excited about the, the content and the discussion uh, of, the, of the workshop today, and um, we'll be sending out a survey uh, probably in the next couple of weeks to try and get some um, feedback from the different groups, uh, and we would really love to hear um, your thoughts on, on the material that was presented, but then also topics that you'd like to see for the, the future workshop. So, um, Ed, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you for comments and, and thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your time. Yes, uh, thank you, Susan. Thanks for your hard work on uh, moderating today. Uh, I had a lot of sound here in the background, so it was very good that you, you took care of that for me today. And so I so really greatly appreciate that. Uh, we do hope to have a survey come out here within uh, a couple of weeks. We, we're working on the questions right now and kind of needed to have this presentation to, to get some, some uh, information uh, as to what to ask you. Uh, so please take some time, fill it out. Uh, we do look to have another uh, workshop in a year's time. Hopefully we will be back in person in Topeka and, and uh, uh, the Soybean Commission will buy us all a steak again. Uh, as they have in years past, but uh, till then we can uh, do that. Uh, we, uh, 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 
again, greatly appreciate our speakers, uh, Ted, uh, Jim, and Andy, and, and Jill, and, and Colin. That, that's been great to have you spend some time with us this morning and, and provide uh, a, a little bit of conversation uh, regarding your, your businesses and your, your experiences and with biodiesel and such. And so uh, again, look for the survey. With that, I will uh, pro provide some contact information. Certainly, if you have uh, uh, questions about biodiesel, uh, reach out to any of us. Uh, uh, certainly, if we don't know the answer, we'll turn it over to Scott Fenwick there and at the National Biodiesel Board. Uh, but again, thanks for attending this morning, and uh, we, we hope to visit with you again sometime down the road. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much, you guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. If any of y'all still have time, do you mind if I ask another question? Sure. Uh, so I've heard that biodiesel is sustainable in part because the carbon emissions um, from burning biodiesel is offset by the carbon consumed by the plants that make it, uh, specifically soybean, soybeans. Um, so is biodiesel really a sustainable thing for the environment? if we're using anything less than B100 blends. So, so I, would, mm -hmm. I would say any, any offset in carbon, right, uh, is gonna be an advantage. So even if you're using a B20 blend, um, you're, still, you're still reducing carbon and overall net carbon um, uh, into the atmosphere from, from the um, reduction in, in petroleum fuel that's being used. Obviously, the higher the blends that you go, uh, the more of a, of a benefit there is from that. Um, but I also think it has to do with the, um, the idea of it being something that is renewable and also impacting the, you know, impacting the market from the, the soybean perspective, right? And like, I, I, think, I think, Ben, you were on the call earlier when, when they talked about the fact that the biodiesel, you know, came around from the fact that we had all of this oil sitting around from crushing soybeans. And the, it was it was ending up hurting the price of soybeans because of this waste that you had, right? So, um, if you look at it being something that is a, a waste product, um, you know, coming from a waste product in general, uh, I think that also adds to the to the advantage of it and the and the benefit of it, in addition to the carbon reduction that you have, a net carbon reduction that you have from from its utilization. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah, Ed, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would, and the, that's uh, you. You went at it from the carbon side. I'd go at it from the energy side. Uh, soybeans is generally, if you look at the biodiesel coming from uh, soybeans, you've got uh, four units of uh, energy being produced from one unit of input energy. So if you put a, a gallon of, of diesel fuel in, you get four out. And so from that perspective, you know you can we can go with the biodiesel down that path and it you could see a it's somewhat realistic to consider the ability that we might be able to switch over to completely a biofuel at some point in the future um, with that sort of a energy return of putting one unit in and getting four back so th there's that aspect to it too that's that's a pretty rough way of looking at it but that's that is uh, uh, one one way to look at it. There's also the the re and Susan, you touched on this a, a bit. Uh, the reality of the fact that we can't just instantly switch; it has to be a gradual process. Um, just because you know society is huge, um, we can't immediately change to any other fuel, whether that's electric, whether it's biodiesel, whether it's ethanol. It's not going to happen overnight, and so every bit that we can do helps helps with those environmental issues 
and helps to improve the situation. And so just keep pushing. Eventually, maybe we'll get there to B100. <laughs> That's a really good point. Thank you, Tammy. Um, yeah, talking about the gradual things, like uh, it was gradual for us to switch to higher blends of um, gasoline with ethanol, as well as just a funny example when the US tried to switch to the metric system all at once and it totally failed. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, you go back, I, I like to have this lecture in, in one of my entry level classes about technology taking hold. Uh, uh, Colonel Drake hit oil in Pennsylvania in, in uh, 1849 or some number like that. We didn't really become a gasoline or petroleum based uh, 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 society until the 1900s, you know, 1905, 1910, somewhere in there. Um, so, you know, 50 years or better, 50, 60 years to adopt a new technology, infrastructure and all that has to come into place and as well as the utilization. And so, so those, all those things come together and, and it takes time. So, you know, the biodiesel industry is 25 years in the making plus and uh, uh, so it, it we're, we're halfway there maybe even. Hey, hey Jancy, are you still on the call? I was just gonna say we might want to stop recording but um, I don't know yeah. if I can. I don't know if I can. Let me see if I can. I can't stop the recording because she's doing it.